Sounds good. I'll give it uh, till 7.05. Is that uh, fair, Peter? Peter, it's Tammy. Sorry, uh, Councillor Bowman was on the pla in the platform earlier. You were tied up. He was advising that he is on his way in. He might be a few minutes late. Thank you, Tammy. Peter, I'm having issues with my uh, internet again. Um, I'm on my hotspot right now on the phone, so if I get knocked out, I'll be signing back in, but I am here. Thank you, Councillor. So Mr. Chair, I do see eight members present, either in person or online. We can proceed if you wish, and we'll confirm at, um, at during roll call. Okay, thank you very much, uh, City Clerk, and uh, good evening, and welcome to our meeting of Brampton's Planning and Development Committee. And we'll begin the meeting with the City Clerk calling the roll for attendance at tonight's meeting. Members of committee, I will call your name. Please indicate your presence at tonight's meeting. Councillor Santos. Present. Councillor Vasante. Is present in person. Councillor Willens. I'm present, Peter. Councillor Pelleschi. Present. Councillor Bowman. Present. Is present in person. Councillor Williams. Good evening, I'm here. Councillor Fortini. I do not see in the session. Uh, Councillor Singh. Present. Councillor Dillon. I do not see present. And Chair Medeiros. President. Uh, Mr. Chair, you do have a quorum present. You can proceed. Thank you very much. Our next item is approval of the agenda. Does any member wish to add a business item to tonight's meeting? Mr. Chair, uh, there are a few updates I would like to go over with the committee. Yep, uh, please go ahead. So first, um, in regards to the first item on tonight's agenda, which is the statutory public notice item 5.1, and this is in regard to a citywide community improvement plan for office employment. Um, that item uh, was not published with the original agenda on May 6th. It was published with the revised agenda um, on May 13th. However, uh, the wrong report was published on that particular item. So it was corrected this morning with the correct staff report published. Um, committee uh, has a couple of options in front of it. Committee can decide to continue and deal with that item this evening in spite of the fact it was just published uh, online today or committee has the option to defer that item uh, to the June 6 uh, planning and development committee hearing so that's just one item for consideration secondly there's a number of uh, additional up agenda updates that were received late today by the clerk's office and I just wish to go over those for the committee's benefit the first is in regards to item um, Added item 11.3 on today's agenda. That's correspondence dated May 16th from the CANIF group, and that's in regard to item 5.1, the item I just spoke about a moment ago on today's agenda regarding citywide community improvement plan for office employment. Um, there is also added correspondence 11.4 on today's agenda, and that's correspondence from Megan Bennett, Brampton resident, and this is in regard to item 7.2 on today's agenda, a staff report regarding an application to amend the zoning bylaw 
Corbett Land Strategies, 58 Jesse Street in Ward 3, to permit the development of six three-story townhouse units uh, at 58 Jesse Street. Um, also, there is added, an added delegation, which will be identified as 6.3, <clears throat> excuse me, on tonight's agenda. It's a delegation from Richard Domes, uh, Ganya Walker Domes, regarding item 5.3 on tonight's agenda, a staff report regarding an application to amend the official plan, block plan and zoning bylaw uh, for property at 8671 Heritage Road, um, northeast of Heritage Road and Lion Head Golf Club Road to permit a seven-story retirement residence with 122 units, um, among other matters. We also have added delegation 6.4 on this evening's agenda, a delegation from Michael Vanny, uh, Weston Consulting, and this is in regard to item 5.4 on tonight's agenda, a staff report regarding the application to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw, Weston Consulting to facilitate a range of businesses, medical and professional office uses within an existing heritage building at 10254 Your Ontario Street in Ward 2. And finally, uh, there was some late correspondence that was received from Genya Walker Domes that will be identified as 11.5 on the agenda. That correspondence has yet to be distributed to members of committee. It will uh, be distributed right after approval of the agenda. And it's in regards to item 5.5 on tonight's agenda which is, bear with me, a statutory public notice item regarding an application to temporarily amend the zoning bylaw, Glen Schnard Associates to permit outdoor storage of 56 trucks and trailers along with associated office space to be located within an existing building for a temporary period of up to three years in Ward 6. And Mr. Chair, those are the updates for today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Singh. Yeah. Um, when will um, will this get uh, ratified on um, this Wednesday, or will it get ratified at the following council meeting? Through you, Mr. Chair, the recommendations from tonight's Planning and Development Committee will be presented to Council on Wednesday, May 18th, um, for ratification. The minutes will follow the next meeting in June. Okay, so um, uh, I'll wait for if anybody has any comments, but I'd like to refer the report that was by mistake to Wednesday. I'd like the opportunity to read it uh, thoroughly. I did look at the older one, but I, I didn't know there was a mistake. So I would move the motion that we just refer it to council so everybody has the opportunity um, to read the correct report. Thank you. So through you, Mr. Chair, just for, for clarity, Councillor Singh is moving referral of item 5.1 to Council on Wednesday, the statutory public notice item. Okay. As, a, as opposed to a deferral. Yes, uh, I, I, we don't, I, I don't, uh, it's up to my colleagues. I, I'd like the opportunity to, uh, you were saying it was, it was uh, when did you correct it, Peter? It was corrected this morning. So. Um, the item was proper notice was given on that particular item 5.1 um, but the yeah. report wasn't uh, available till last week and the report that was published on Friday was the incorrect report so it was corrected yeah, this yeah. morning uh, however uh, my advice would be that uh, that item is still subject to a statutory public meeting so it would be probably more appropriate to defer that item to the next planning committee as opposed to uh, referring it to council because um, it's without the benefit of a statutory public meeting. Oh, it's just a stat. Yeah, okay, never mind. I, I, I'm actually good to. Uh, if it's just uh, the public meeting, then uh, uh, I'm okay. Because um, I, I guess we'll have the opportunity to comment on it later, anyways, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so I, I'm okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand down any, any changes. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you, Councillor Singh. Uh, Councillor Palushi does not need to speak anymore. Okay. Uh, so I do have a motion uh, by Councillor Pileshi, uh to move uh, approval of the agenda. Is there anyone opposed? I see none. Motion carries. Yes. Through you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I, there, I, I'm, I apologize if I'm a bit confused. Councillor Singh has withdrawn his referral. Did Councillor Singh move deferral of 5.1? No, he just left it standing. So we're going to yeah, I, uh, I stand down any changes. Uh, he wants you, to uh, proceed with the statutory public meeting today. Thank you. It's up to the colleagues, but I'm good with it. Yep, exactly. Thank you, Chair. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I do have a motion moved by Councillor Plushy. Uh, is anyone opposed? I see none. Motion carries. We now go on to declarations of interest. Uh, do any members have a declaration of pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Bring the matter to be considered on today's agenda. I see none, and the City Clerk will so note for the meeting. Consent motion. I will now read the relevant agenda items, and members can identify any items to be held for debate. Item 7.1, a staff report regarding application to amend the zoning bylaw, uh, WE Elk Bread Associates Incorporated, Greenway Real Estate Incorporated, 5 Copper Road, Ward 3, to permit the outdoor storage of trucks and trailers. I would like to hold that item, City Clerk. Uh, item 7.3, a staff report regarding city initiated official plan amendment to correct the right of way widths for Clarkway Drive, Area 47, Ward 10. In consent, item 7.4, staff report regarding application to amend the zoning bylaw, Madame Limited, Corsac Urban Planning, Mississauga Road, and Zero Mississauga Road, Ward 6. In consent, uh, item 7.5, application to amend the official plan, secondary plan zoning bylaw, City of Brampton Community Services, 140 Howden Boulevard and 150 Howden Boulevard, south of Howden Boulevard, west of Central Park Drive, Ward 7. In consent, uh, items uh, 8.1, minutes Brampton Heritage Board, April 26. In consent, item 8.2, minutes Cycling Advisory Committee, April 21st. In consent, I have a motion then, move, I'll, I'll pass it over to city clerk to uh, um, to uh, uh, provide a summary of uh, our the items that we've moved in consent, and then we'll proceed with a uh, uh, recorded vote, and I have a motion moved by Councillor Bowman to approve the consent motion to the city clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to members of committee and members of the public watching or participating in person in today's meeting. The consent motion is, is items that are deemed to be non-controversial and are approved in, in one motion. So the items that are going to be included in the consent motion tonight include 7.3, a staff report on the city-initiated official plan amendment to correct the right-of-way of wits for Clarkway Drive and Ward 10. Uh, item 7.4, staff report on an amendment to the zoning bylaw, Madame Credit River at 10 201 Mississauga Road and 0 Mississauga Road in Ward 6. Item 7.5, a staff report regarding an application to amend the official plan, secondary plan, and zoning bylaw, uh, tent or 140 Howden <coughs> Boulevard and 150 Howden Boulevard um, in Ward 7. Item 8.1, minutes from the Brampton Heritage Board meeting of April 26. And item 8.2, minutes from the Cycling Advisory Committee of April 21st. The balance of the agenda will be considered in agenda order uh, throughout the meeting. So a recorded vote is required. All members in favor of the consent motion, please indicate. Councillor Santos. Yes. Councillor Vasante. Yes. That's a yes. Councillor Willens. Councillor Willens seems to have uh, dropped off. Councillor Pileshi. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Bowman. Yes. That's a yes. Councillor Williams. Yes. Councillor Fortini is still absent. Yes. Oh, thank yes. you. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Singh. Yes. Councillor Dillon uh, appears to be absent. Uh, Chair Medeiros. Yes. Uh, that motion carries eight to zero. Thank you very much. Our next item is statutory public meeting. Um, we have uh, the intent, uh, the proposal to be heard at the public meeting are the result of applications made under the Planning Act. Uh, these are not proposals of the City of Brampton unless they're specifically identified as city-initiated proposals. Uh, we do have tonight two city-initiated proposals for statutory public meeting. The intent of this public meeting is to receive submissions from the public regarding these proposals. Given we may have persons watching this meeting through the City's live stream, we will have staff present each proposal subject to a statutory public meeting unless committee decides otherwise. After receiving any pre-registered delegations, members of the committee may ask questions for clarification, but will not engage in debate on the proposal at this time. 
Committee consideration of the proposal will occur at a future meeting when planning staff bring forward the final recommendation report on each proposal. The city also has posted to its website, Brampton.ca, supporting information and documentation for these development applications for public review and uh, reference. We will now proceed to consider six items on uh, tonight's uh, statutory public meeting agenda. And after consideration of these public meeting items, committee will deal with the balance of the agenda items on tonight's agenda. Our first is a staff report regarding 5.1, citywide community improvement plan for office employment. And I will now hand it over to Marilla Palermo. Uh, welcome Marilla uh, for our staff presentation. Morella, you're muted at the moment. Oh, sorry about that. Good evening, Chair, members of committee, staff, and the public. My name is Mala Palermo. I am the policy planner assigned to lead the Community Improvement Plan for Office Employment. The purpose of this public meeting, again, is to provide information to the public and to seek feedback. Next slide, please. Thank you. The proposed CIP would be applied citywide. Next slide. In January of 2019, staff, Council directed staff to prepare a report for Council's consideration for a potential citywide improvement plan to assist in attracting additional employment and employment development and redevelopment in Brampton. In May of 2019, Council directed staff to prepare a new citywide CIP to attract quality employment in key sectors such as innovation technology, entrepreneurship, advanced manufacturing, health and life sciences. In December of 2019, the city hired the consulting services of MBLC to complete an employment assessment to determine the appropriateness of the citywide CIP. Next slide, please. In April of 2021, council endorsed MBLC's employment study, which recommended moving forward with the citywide CIP with two key incentives. The first one was to move forward with the tax increment equivalent grant for office employment, and also to participate in the Region of Peel's major office incentive program by offering these, the TEAK incentive at the local level. Next slide, please. The city's economic recovery strategy, which was endorsed in May of 2020, had recommended moving forward with the citywide CIP under the investment category of the four major cornerstones that was recommended to support businesses across the city in a variety of, wide variety of sectors. Next slide, please. The community improvement plan under subsection, under subsection of 28.2 of the Planning Act allows local municipalities to designate an area as a community improvement project area as per the official plan. A community improvement plan allows municipalities to offer financial and non-financial incentives to private sector, to the private sector to achieve specific employment, to achieve, sorry, specific objectives such as employment growth that would otherwise not occur naturally. The CIP incentive alone is not the main driver of attracting new office development to an area. It's also implies that there should be also other improvements such as infrastructure improvements and public amenity space investments. The CIP can be offered for a prescribed period of time, such as five years, and can be reviewed on, to ensure the goals and objectives of the citywide CIP meets the needs of the city. Staff this evening are recommending that the CIP align with the Region of Peel's major office incentive program that is due to expire in April of 2026. The CIP also aligns with the terms of council priorities and the Brampton 2040 vision in, a, in attracting new employment to the city uh, and improving the quality of life for city of Brampton residents. Next slide, please. As of Q4 2019, Brampton had approximately 4.62 million square feet of existing office space, excluding the public sector investments in downtown Brampton and South Fletcher's courthouse. 1.76 million square feet, or 38% of the total office inventory was built in the last 20 years, equating to approximately 88,000 square feet of new office space per year. There was a significant drop in new office space over the past five years to only 64,000 square feet. 
that would total about 13,000 square feet of office space per year. Office space, office space vacancy rates has gone from just under 9% in 2016 to over 1.1% 1 .1 in 2020. And we're currently standing at this year, the first quarter of 2022 at 3.5% vacancy. Investors and site selectors continue to search for readily available type A office space with tight turnaround times. Next slide, please. The CIP recommends to move forward with three immediate implementation recommendations. The first being the tax equivalent grant program, which is a grant program to offer a rebate to offset property tax increases as a result of redevelopment over a specific period of time to participate in the Region of Peel's matching grant program that's being offered through their Teague incentive, and to look at expediting planning reviews that city would provide dedicated staff, staff team to meet with the applicant, its tenants and or consultants to ensure the project is delivered expeditiously as possible. Next slide, please. So as mentioned in the previous slides, the preferred incentive to move forward with is the tax increment equivalent grant. Again, this grant is to offset a portion of property tax increases that the owner would face as a result of redevelopment. And this would result typically over a 10 year period for off the office space component of a building. Again, it would, only, it would also be considered to apply to complementary uses to the office space, such as research and laboratory space. The eligibility requirements state that we should look forward to a minimum of 25,000 square feet of new office space. This would exclude renovate, renovations of existing office space, that the, owner, that the building should be owner-occupied or multi-tenant buildings, that the mixed-use development or structures would be new office space only, and that the change of use from, you could also consider change of use from warehouse to office space. By implementing the citywide CIP T program, through the citywide program, the city will be able to participate in the region's Teague offer, being offered through their major office incentive program that was launched in Q2 of 2021. Next slide, please. This sample table looks at a site that's approximately 3.884 acres in site, in area, sorry, and looks at what would happen in terms of the property taxes collected um, when the site is pre is vacant office space versus post when it's developed with office. So as you can see in this table here, this is over a 10 year period that where the owner or the land, the, um, the owner or the operator of the site would be locked into a rate of the first year, and then they would be paying a certain amount of property taxes. So there's a pre-development taxes, which would represent the vacant office space versus if the office were, the land were to be office uh, developed for new office space in the second column and then in the first column and then the rebate being reflected in the second column through being offered through the T program. So if you notice that at the bottom, if we do offer the T program and encourage the office space development, we'd collect about 4.5 times more property taxes than if the lands were to remain vacant office. Next slide, please. The community improvement plan will be evaluated based on the following documents, the planning act, the provincial policy statement, the growth plan, the region appeals official plan, our city of Brampton official plan, and in addition to the Brampton 2040 vision. Next slide, please. This slide provides a timeline. Since the endorsement of MBLC study in March of 2021, staff have been working with finance and economic development to develop a community improvement plan along with the implementation guidelines. We are moved forward to submitting a draft of the CIP to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for review back in March. And they require, as per the Planning Act, 60 days to review the document prior to the statutory public meeting. As of today, we were notified that the province will be providing their comments after June the 2nd. Following that, we will move forward with the recommendation report and adoption of the bylaw to adopt the CIP and then launch the program shortly after. Next slide, please. So the next steps, as we are today at the public meeting, we did issue public notice in the newspaper on April 21st of 2022. 
Again, any comments received at this evening's meeting, including the ones collected from the ministry, will be considered and will be taken into account in the recommendation report and the final adoption of the CIP bylaw. Next slide, please. This report and presentation associated with tonight's meeting can be found on, uh, online at www.branton.ca under meetings and agenda page. And again, my name is Marella Palermo and my contact information is available on the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so before we go to comments, um, City Clerk, do we have any public uh, delegations? Through you, Mr. Chair, there are no registered public delegations. I'm just going to look in the audience, see if anybody wishes to speak on this matter. And I don't see anybody. And there is correspondence 11.3 from the CANF group on this matter. Okay. So I do see Councillor Vicente who wants to uh, provide a comment in the form of a question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Morella, for the presentation. Going through the report, uh, this is exactly what Council was looking for uh, when we first brought this about. Uh, this is badly needed uh, in order to make Brampton competitive and attract business investment. My question, Mr. Chair, is um, if we approve the CIP at the end of this year, as the report states that we would be able to, is there any possibility of offering the incentives retroactively to uh, applications that may have been received before Q4 2022? Uh, through the chair, I can respond to that question. We are considering that at this time. And as I mentioned that um, we will look at all applications, development applications received, and we'll look at the eligibility requirements and if they are in the process of already have been submitted and they do satisfy the requirements, um, they would be considered eligible for the program. But again, that will be reviewed through the implementation guidelines. Uh, thank you and through you, Chair. So would staff be able to come back to us when they report back with uh, potential uh, timelines or periods where business would be uh, or a proposal would be eligible? Uh, through the chair, yes, we will provide that in the recommendation report with that information. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Happy to move. Thank you very much. So we do have a motion made by Councillor Vicente uh, to um, that the report titled Information Report Citywide Community Improvement Plan for Office Employment to the Planning Development Committee of May 16th be received and that the Planning, Building, and Economic Development staff be directed to report back to the Planning Development Committee with the results of the public meeting and staff recommendation. Is there anyone opposed? I see no objections, so the motion carries. We now move on to uh, staff report uh, 5.2 regarding city initiated official plan amendment and administrative authority by law amendment. And I will now hand it over to Carolyn Crozier. Uh, welcome, Carolyn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone, members of the committee, the public, and staff. I'm Carolyn Crozier. I'm the strategic leader with the city planning and design department. Division, sorry. Uh, the purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and seek feedback on the proposed city initiated official plan amendment on delegated authority. Next slide, please. This official plan amendment will apply citywide. Next slide, please. So I'll just provide a bit of background on the reason we're pursuing uh, this official plan amendment. Uh, Bill 13, the Supporting People and Businesses Act, uh, received royal assent in December of 2021. And this bill introduced changes to the Planning Act that grants council the ability to delegate certain uh, decisions um, around decision-making authority. And this delegated authority can be given for removing holding provisions, temporary use bylaws, other mining minor zoning bylaws, uh, including housekeeping bylaws. In order to implement this authority, um, official plan policies are required to specify the types of bylaw that may be delegated, which is the reason for the official plan amendment. Next slide, please. 
So from a, a practical process perspective, the only matter that changes with delegated authority is who makes the decision. All notice requirements, um, appeal rights, and conformity with provincial policy remains intact. Uh, Council also has the authority to set conditions on delegated authority should it be granted, and Council can also withdraw the delegated authority at any time through an amending bylaw. Next slide, please. So a little bit of um, information around the rationale or intent of Bill 13. So it was introduced by the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. Um, changes to the Planning Act are aligned with current provincial initiatives to be more streamlined and efficient in the planning approval process. Uh, in addition to the intended benefits that you'll see on the screen, uh, some additional benefits that may be realized should we adopt uh, delegated authority include accelerated approvals for sites zoned with holdings, which could translate to cost savings for applicants and bringing development to fruition sooner. And by removing minor technical decisions from PDC and from council agendas, it will also work to create capacity for more significant policy and development application discussions. Next slide, please. So the official plan amendment that's in front of you this evening is included as is in appendix A in the report, um, contemplates delegating authority for the lifting of holding provisions and for housekeeping amendments to the Commissioner of Planning, Building and Economic Development or their delegate. And while the ability to extend additional delegated authority to the Commissioner is provided for in Bill 13, our staff working group, which included staff from legal uh, city planning and design from a policy perspective and with colleagues from development services, it was re recommended that we scope um, or limit delegated authority to the two items you see on the screen as they're purely technical and no public meeting is required for those types of amendments. Uh, the delegation of temporary use bylaws or other minor bylaws would still require a public meeting like we're having tonight and staff are of the opinion that preserving the ability of the public to be heard by PDC and council should be retained. And should council choose to approve the official plan amendment and no appeals be filed, um, a minor amendment to the city's administrative authority bylaw will also be required. Um, that uh, that amendment is not subject to public meeting, but it has been included as an amendment, um, or sorry, as a schedule, schedule B to the report. Next slide, please. So with respect to the next steps, uh, staff will review any comments received. To date, uh, no comments have been received on, on this item. Uh, public notice was given in the paper. A final recommendation report will be advanced to Council for a decision, and that recommendation will include a detailed process of what this delegated authority would look like um, internally. Any comments or issues raised will, will be addressed in that recommendation report, and staff would contact and follow up with any members of the public who have spoken, written, or advised of an interest in monitoring this proposal. Next slide, please. So this report um, the report associated with tonight's meeting is available online and the presentation will be available online shortly. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Happy to answer any questions you may have right now and questions can also be sent to the email address that was shown on the screen. Thank you very much. City Clerk, do we have any public delegations? Through you, Mr. Chair, there are no registered public delegations. I'll just look in the audience, see if anybody wishes to speak on this item and I don't see anybody and there is no correspondence on this item as well. Okay, thank you. Over to Councillor Pelosi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I only have one brief comment. Um, with respect to this uh, this bylaw, and I guess I'm, I'm a little bit confused that uh, staff are bringing this to public delegation when this council has requested additional information on Bill 13, Supporting People and Businesses Act, um, which uh, we have not yet received. So uh, I, I don't take this as as really housekeeping, um, just uh, I guess I'm a little bit confused that um, council hasn't been awarded the opportunity for the additional information and, and what it truly means, the Bill 13 as a whole, um, with respect to uh, uh, to this item. <clears throat> and that's the only comment I'll make. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Do, does anyone from staff want to respond or provide any comment? 
Um, to the chair, I, I certainly could. I'd also be looking to uh, Alan Parsons or Bob Yerke to speak. I, I do want to ask a question through the chair, just to clarify um, that the councillor was asking specifically about Bill 13, or is it Bill 109? Because Bill 109 is the most recent bill that has um, very significant impacts to the corporation. And um, a report is forthcoming to council on believe it's the 25th uh, committee of council. Um, I also see that our commissioner Jason is on the line as well, if he'd wish to speak to this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm happy to respond to the question. Bill 109 is uh, still uh, another piece of the puzzle that the, the province has handed down that we're awaiting information, but uh, the supporting people and businesses act was uh, uh, additional information was requested. I don't recall this being a piece of the items that uh, had come to council um, by way of the public uh, report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, would you like to uh, speak? I think that uh, uh, in regards to uh, my staff's presentation here, uh, I think we wanted to make sure that uh, we are in line with the spirit of, uh, of the bill. If Councillor uh, three of Mr. Chair, if Councillor uh, Palashi wants us to uh, provide additional information, I think we'll, we're more than happy to do so. Uh, I also have uh, both my directors here. Uh, we obviously, could be that some discussions may have happened uh, before I took on that role. So I would like to see if Alan or uh, Bob have any additional information to add here. Well, I, 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 yeah, go ahead, Alan. Sorry, yeah, through, through you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to really echo the, the comments from uh, uh, from Commissioner Schmidt Shukri to identify that the staff would be able to, within a forthcoming app, uh, report back on this matter, include some additional information as it relates to, to that bill. Uh, my, myself, I wasn't aware of some uh, uh, request for information back on that bill, but we will follow up with, uh, with others within the staff here at the city, uh, including our, our clerks, to really understand the direction that way, and we'll uh, report back in, in that regard. Thanks. Yeah, may, may I suggest as a chair, maybe that uh, if there are some outstanding information, maybe uh, councillors or council pairs could schedule uh, some time with staff in the meantime while I report uh, if they have additional questions or require more information on uh, the respective bills. If that's okay with staff, maybe uh, reach out to uh, the ward pairings and see if they'd be interested in a briefing. We, we can certainly do that, uh, Chair. It's Bob here. But I think um, we have in the past also provided uh, briefing notes for, for Council as a whole where there's, uh, you know, particular key items. I think in case 109, there, there was uh, an earlier briefing note that we can go back to and, and make sure that that's uh, redistributed. And if there's other additional elements, absolutely, we can cover those off in uh, ward pairing meetings or, or uh, something like that. Uh, Jason, would that be something you'd be wanting to pursue? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think the, that's uh, exactly right. And uh, if there was anything that was uh, missed previously uh, uh, through Mr. Chair in terms of uh, what, uh, what Councilor Parecchi has said, I think we'll be more than happy to follow up on that and uh, fill the gap. Okay, that's great. And, that, and then that's probably appropriate, especially at the public uh, meeting stage. So uh, unless there's any other comments, Councillor Pelushi, then uh, I think we do have a plan. I do have a motion moved by Councillor Pelushi uh, to uh, move the report. We'll take it as read. Uh, and with the direction that staff reach out to councillors, uh, maybe redistribute the note and provide additional information uh, or briefing uh, at the direction of uh, the work counselors. Okay, is there anyone opposed? I see none. Motion carries. Uh, our next item is uh, staff report 5.3 uh, application to amend the official plan, block zoning bylaws, Zia Mohammed and Shamla Amid, uh, Gangel Walker Domes, Heritage Road. 8671 Heritage Road, Northeast of Heritage Road, in Linehead Golf Club Road, Ward 6. And uh, I believe I will hand it over now to uh, Tejinder Sidhu. And welcome, Tejinder. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and members of the public. My name is Tejinder Sidhu, and I'm assigned to this application. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide information on the application as well as receive comments. 
So as indicated on the slide, the application is to amend the official plan, secondary plan, block plan, and zoning bylaw amendment. The application is located at 8671 Heritage Road. The applicant for this file is Guinean Walker Domes, specifically Mr. Richard Domes, and the uh, owner of the site is Yeh Mohammed and Shamla Hamid. Next slide, please. So as indicated by the slide, the location of the property is located in the southwestern portion of the city of Brampton. The major intersection is Lionhead Golf Club Road and Heritage Road. Next slide. So this is an aerial view of the site. The site's indicated in the blue there. Um, the lands opposite of the site are zoned agricultural. Then the lands that are at the rear of the site are zoned residential. That's the existing residential subdivision. And then um, we can also see that adjacent to the site, there are lands zoned commercial. Next slide. So this slide shows site visit photos. The photo on the left is taken from the front of the site. And on the right, there is a photo taken from the rear of the site, um, which is taken from Hammersley Court. Next slide. So in terms of the proposal itself, a seven-story retirement building is proposed with 122 retirement units. There is a combination of surface parking as well as underground parking spaces. The total gross floor area is 8,216 square meters. The net density proposed is 215 units per net hectare as well as a 1.45 FSI. Um, another key feature of this proposal is that access is proposed through Hammersley Court. Hammersley Court is currently a cul-de-sac that the applicant is proposing to extend onto the site. There's also an existing residential dwelling on the site that will be used as an accessory building. And lastly, there are on-site natural heritage features located that will be protected. Next slide. So um, on the slide over here, there's just some um, elevations of the proposed retirement building. Next slide. So in terms of the policy breakdown, the site is designated residential and open space in the city of Brampton official plan. The residential designation permits a variety of residential uses as well as non-limited um, non-residential uses, including the proposed retirement home. And, and also for an open space designation, it identifies natural heritage features. And in this case, an amendment to the official plan is required because for the specific area that this site is located in, the policy directs that the density shall generally be limited to four stories in height and it shall generally be limited to 50 units per net hectare. Next slide. So the site is located within the Bramwise secondary plan and in this plan, it's designated low, medium density, woodlot, and valley land. An amendment is required to redesignate the lands to medium, high density residential, woodlot, and valley land. And this amendment will permit the proposed density as well as the unit type. Next slide. And lastly, the plan, uh, the site is located in the Riverview Heights block plan. It's designated open space, woodlots, low, medium density residential. And an amendment is also required to the block plan to redesignate to medium high density residential and open space with lots. Next slide. And in terms of the zoning bylaw, the site is currently zoned agricultural special section 429. The uses permitted in this zoning designation is one single detached dwelling as well as the other uses that are listed on the slide. An amendment to the zoning bylaw will be required because the, to permit the, the proposed use. Next slide. And, um, oh, sorry. Okay, so in this slide, it, um, this is the zoning bylaw amendment submitted by the applicant and it also shows the schedule. So the, currently what's proposed is um, there'll be an open space zone as well as a residential apartment zone. So the open space use identifies that there's um, open space uses for the existing natural heritage on the site, as well as a residential apartment zone that will permit the proposed retirement home, as well as a senior citizen's dwelling, nursing home, and purposes accessory to the other permitted purposes. Should also be noted that the zoning by amendment will be further reviewed through the review of this application. Next slide. And then in terms of a planning framework summary, the application will be evaluated based on provincial legislation, including the Planning Act, Provincial Policy Statement, 
Girls Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, Region Appeal Official Plan, as well as City of Brampton documents, including the official plan, the Brown West Secondary Plan, and the Riverview Heights Block Plan. And also through the review, this application will be checked to, um, to ensure how it meets the principles of the Brampton 2040 vision. Next slide. So there have been the following issues and opportunities noted on the slide. The first one is density and compatibility of the proposed development. Density will be evaluated in the sense of um, the proposed density of the retirement home itself, as well as its compatibility with the surrounding land uses. The second item that will be looked at further, as well as the third item, speaks to the extension of Hammersley Court. We will be evaluating to see how this can be implemented, whether this is functional or su and suitable for the area. The fourth item noted is the protection and establishment of appropriate buffers for environmental features located on the site. The fifth issue that will be looked into further is whether there's sufficient amenity area provided for future residents, including indoor and outdoor amenity space. And the last item that staff will be looking into further through the review of this application is clarifying the nature of the accessory use that the existing home will provide for the proposed retirement home. Next slide. So in terms of next steps, the items that are highlighted in blue are things that have already been completed. So a notice of complete application has been issued in January 2022. It has been circulated to departments and agencies and the notice of public meeting has also been sent out and now we're at the public meeting stage. Now in terms of next steps, staff will continue to collect and review comments and, at, and then once that is done, a recommendation or final report will be prepared. It is noted that when the recommendation report is pre uh, prepared, staff will provide full response to all comments received by members of the public. And lastly, there's an appeal period. If um, the recommendation report does get approved by council, then there will be an applicable appeal period following afterwards. Next slide. And um, so last, so this concludes my presentation. Once again, my name is Tijinder Sidhu. I'm the city planner assigned for this file. The applicant's information is also noted here, which is Richard Domes from Gannion Walker Domes. And I understand that he will also have a presentation afterwards. So if anybody has any questions, please let me know either um, through this meeting or afterwards through email or a phone call. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I guess public delegation city clerk, uh, we do have Mr. Domes as suggested by our planner. And, and if we have anyone following. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, just look, do a look and see if anybody wishes to speak on this item after the applicant speaks. And I don't see anybody, so Mr. Domes can come forward to the, the microphone uh, to address committee and we'll bring up his presentation. There is uh, correspondence 11.2 on tonight's agenda regarding this matter as well. Good. So we're just going to bring up uh, Richard's presentation. Charlotte will bring it up momentarily. And Richard, you can proceed. You have up to five minutes to address the committee. Great, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members committee. My name is Richard Domes from Ganyan Walker Domes LTD. I'm an agent for Zia Mohammed and Shamila Hamid, who is the registered owners of the property located at 8671 Heritage Road. My clients have made application to amend the city's official plan, the Riverview Heights block plan, and the city's zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. The site uh, area uh, equals 1.3 hectares or approximately three and a quarter acres with approximately 70 meters of frontage along Heritage Road. There is a small reserve um, along the eastern limits of the property adjacent to Hammersley Court, so there's technically no frontage along Hammersley Court itself. The property is currently being used as a single detached dwelling that's accessed from Heritage Road via a long driveway mid-block to the property's frontage. Next slide, please. This slide shows some, uh, some street views and photographs of the existing conditions. On the top left uh, corner of the screen is the existing dwelling that exists and is proposed to be retained through the development proposal. At the top right hand of your screen, you can see a street view from Heritage Road, which shows at the very bottom left of the screen, the portion of Levi Creek that traverses the subject site. The subject dwelling at the 
rear of the, of the, of the property, manicure lawns on both the north and the south sides of the existing driveway, and just to the south or to the right of the driveway is a existing headwater drainage feature that we'll speak to later on in my presentation. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a street view taken from the temporary terminus of Hammersley Court looking towards the west at the subject site and adjacent parcel to the south. Next slide, please. As indicated by the city's planner, the subject site is located in the Riverview Heights community, which is primarily a low density residential community that is supplemented by commercial uses along Mississauga Road and Steeles Avenue to the south. To the immediate east of the subject site are low density uh, single detached dwellings and the existing terminus of Hambersley Court. To the north, and we'll speak to in a minute, uh, are various environmental and open space features. To the south is a vacant parcel that has recently been rezoned to accommodate commercial development. And to the immediate west is Heritage Road. Next slide, please. So the subject site is highly constrained from an environmental perspective. To the immediate north of the subject site is a provincially significant wetland, which is highlighted in the turquoise hatched color on the screen. In addition, there's the Levi Creek, which traverses the northwest limits of the subject site and is also shown in the hatched turquoise color. In addition, there is a woodlot that exists to the northwest of the subject site, which traverses to the northwest limits. The flood lane from the Levi Creek and its associated setback because of the presence of red side dace in this water feature uh, also encroaches to the subject site. In total, the environmental areas and buffers reduce the development area by 0 0.6 hectares or nearly 1.5 acres. Next slide, please. In addition to the environmental takeaways, two road dedications are planned, being the extension of Hammersley Court to the, into the site and terminating in a cul-de-sac as seen on the screen. In addition, an eight, zero, eight meter widening of Heritage Road is, is also proposed that is in the key plan, which is I appreciate it, hard to see on, on the slide. And that site area, after all the development takeaways, is 0 0.57 hectares or 1.4 acres. And what is proposed within that development area, as mentioned, is the retention of the existing dwelling and its repurposed for secondary uses to the proposed retirement residence. And the re uh, seven-story re retirement residence is outlined in the green, the turquoise color to the south of the, uh, of the environmental features that will accommodate 122 retirement units and a gross floor area of 8,216 square meters or 88,000 square feet. Richard, you have 30 seconds left. Great combination of uh, underground and surface parking is proposed. Next slide, please. And we'll skip to the next slide after that, giving time constraints. Access to the site is proposed via Hammer the extension of Hammersley Court, as indicated in the slide, that will facilitate extension of the sidewalk outlined in blue, and access is to the underground and commercial, and sorry, surface parking areas in green and red. A total of 920 square meters, excuse me, 920 square meters of internal amenity area is proposed to, to, to supplement the outdoor, uh, greater related uh, outdoor space, which is equivalent to 7.5 meters of amenity area per unit, which incorporates pool, fitness, movie room, loc lockers, dining areas, salons, chapels, library, general activity, and private for, these, for the use of building occupants. In the interest of time, I'll end my presentation there and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great, thank you very much. I don't see any speakers, and I do have a motion made by Councillor Williams uh, to uh, move the staff report and correspondence, and we will take the motion as read. Is there anyone opposed? I see none, so the motion carries. Thank you. And our next is item report, uh, staff report uh, item 5.4, uh, application to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw uh, to permit to facilitate a range of business medical professional office uses within an existing heritage building, location 10254 Ontario Street, north of Boulevard Drive, and west of Ontario Street, uh, Ward 2, 
and I will hand it over to Kelly. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and members of public. My name is Kelly Henderson, and I'm the planner assigned to process and review the subject application. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and seek feedback on the application filed by Weston Consulting on behalf of 2757566 Ontario, Inc. Next slide, please. The subject property is located within Ward 2 at 10254 here on Ontario Street in the west side of Brampton. The nearest intersection, major intersection, is here on Ontario Street and Brobear Drive West, and the property is located north of Brobear Drive and west of here on Ontario Street. Next slide, please. The surrounding land uses include industrial to the north, uh, residential to the east, and then industrial to the south, as west as industrial to the west. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the subject application seeks to permit a variety of service commercial uses for the subject site. In order to do this, an official plan amendment, secondary plan amendment, and zoning bylaw amendment are required. The additional uses are retail establishment, service shop, personal service shop, bank, office, medical office, takeout restaurant, health and fitness center, animal hospital, and commercial school. Next slide, please. The official plan designates the subject property as industrial. This permits a variety of uses, including industrial uses and warehouses, as well as some corporate offices. An official plan amendment is required to permit the proposed use. However, it shall be noted that this was not recognized in the information report because the need for the amendment had not been identified at the time. Next slide, please. The secondary plan designates the subject property as general employment one, which permits uses such as warehousing, processing, and manufacturing. An amendment to the secondary plan is required to permit the proposal. Next slide, please. The current zoning for the property is industrial, which again permits uses such as industrial, warehousing, and manufacturing, and some non-industrial accessory uses. A zoning bylaw amendment is required to permit the proposal. Next slide, please. The application is proposing to rezone the subject property from industrial to site-specific service commercial, and the highlight of the proposal uh, permitted uses are shown above. Next slide, please. Prior to finalizing recommendations to Council, this application will be further evaluated for consistency with the Planning Act, Provincial Policy Statement, Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, Region of Peel Official Plan, City of Brampton Official Plan, and the Secondary Plan. Next slide, please. At this time, preliminary issues and opportunities that will need to be addressed include compatibility of the proposed uses with the surrounding industrial uses and the employment designation, as well as compatibility within the existing heritage building. Next slide, please. So we are high, uh, at step at the public meeting. Um, previously, the application was filed with the city on February 2nd, 2022, and deemed complete on March 2nd, 2022. The application was then circulated to commenting departments and agencies. The public notice of this meeting was provided in the newspaper on April 21st. Um, the next step, staff will review the application, including reviewing comments from the public and technical comments, advance a final recommendation report to council for a decision, and any issues raised will be addressed in the recommendation report. Staff will contact and follow up with those residents who have spoken, written in, or advised of an interest in monitoring this proposal. Next slide, please. The report associated with this public meeting is available online, and the presentation will be available online shortly. My contact information is also on the screen, along with Michael Vanny, who represents the applicant. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any public delegations? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'll just check in the audience here, and I don't see anybody. We do have Michael Vanny from Weston Consulting, who's present virtually to make a presentation on behalf of the proponent. Uh, Michael, you are in the session, and we'll just bring up your slides. And you have up to five minutes. You can proceed, Michael. 
Uh, good evening, uh, members of the committee and the public and staff that are joining here this evening. I'll keep my presentation fairly brief. This is Kelly has done a wonderful job at covering a lot of the specifics of the application on the screen for you. Uh, it's just the details that were previously um, said about the application's proponent um, and the official plan and zoning dialogue amendment applications. Uh, next slide, please. So the site actually is the current home of the Learmonti Armstrong Heritage Farmhouse, which used to sit on the entirety of the balance of these land that have been developed over the last few years to encompass uh, four different industrial warehousing buildings, one of them being the large uh, Canadian Tire Warehouse to the south. There have been numerous uh, consent applications, site plan approvals, variances, and a previous official plan amendment on the site. Uh, we're approaching the tail end of the development process for this large block area. Now that the farmhouse has been relocated to its current location, uh, this current official plan and zoning bylaw amendment process is to implement a variety of land uses uh, and permitted uses for the property that would better reflect the built form and the function of the heritage house. Uh, it doesn't really function uh, that well anymore as an industrial designation given the type of property that it is. And the intent of the applications is really to provide uh, a broad uh, range of uses to ensure that it could be leased appropriately in the future and so that it could be maintained uh, over the long term and uh, be kept as a viable heritage resource for the city. Uh, next slide, please. So the relocation of the farmhouse was facilitated through a previous minor variance application, which did permit uh, non-medical office uses uh, on a temporary basis. As I said, this application for you this evening is to uh, make that zoning and official plan designation permanent and fulfill the conditions of the previous minor variance approval back in 2018. Next slide, please. Uh, so just very briefly, here's an image of the relocated farmhouse uh, that was taken um, just a few months ago, back when there was still snow on the ground. Um, there, it does include um, 25 parking spaces located at the rear of the relocated structure, a uh, gross floor of 276 square meters, uh, and there's been various uh, building upgrades that have been completed uh, over, you know, the last few, well, I would say last few years as the property has been relocated. Uh, there's been accessible ramps added, uh, AODA compliance measures have been included throughout the building, uh, there's been structural upgrades, uh, overall the building has been modernized to today's standards, um, non-heritage additions that were made over time were removed when the house was relocated, uh, and there's also been uh, extensive restoration of the facade and the heritage elements, as well as some electrical and mechanical modernization so that this can function as an appropriate uh, office or uh, retail type use. Uh, for a future tenant. Next slide, please. Uh, on the screen is a um, colored site plan, just to give you a little bit of context. The property is accessed uh, at the rear off of um, the driveway that extends from the intersection of here Ontario Street and Tremblay, uh, which is a signalized intersection that predominantly provides access to the Canadian Tire Warehouse. Uh, existing uh, access easements have already been established through the settling off of this property back in 2018 uh, as part of the larger redevelopment process. The application is already uh, site plan approved and uh, the majority of these elements are in the process of being finalized uh, as part of the uh, heritage uh, relocation process. Next slide, please. And on the screen is just a few additional images of the relocated property and some of the restoration works that have been done to restore it back to its uh, original grandeur. Next slide, please. So as I said previously, uh, we're looking to do an official plan amendment application to modify the Snellville Park Lake Secondary Plan, as well as the official plan based on um, Kelly's comments earlier from General Employment 1 to Service Commercial, and this is to permit a range of businesses, professional and medical office uses, and other uses that will complement the existing, the existing structure, as well as the employment area as a whole, and subsequent to that as well, a rezoning application from General Employment to Service Commercial. 
uh, on the screen are the various uses that Kelly had previously mentioned. Uh, we are going to be looking to provide, as, as I said, a mo the most broad range of uses possible that would work with this facility, just in, to ensure that it's long-term viable. Uh, but we are going to continue to work with staff on refining this list and a, for a future recommendation report to this committee. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them and we look forward to continuing to work through this process with the city. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any uh, questions, so I do have a motion uh, uh, moved by Councillor Pelleschi to move receipt uh, and take the motion as read. Is there anyone opposed? I see none. Motion carries. We will now move on to our next item, item 5.5. Uh, application to temporarily amend the zoning bylaw, Glen Starn Associates, 8195 Winston Churchill Boulevard, Ward 6, to permit outdoor storage of 56 trucks and trailers along with associated office space to be located within the existing building. Uh, and I will hand it over now to Noelle Kuba Cub and welcome, uh, welcome Noelle. Thank you, and through you, the chair. Uh, good evening, staff, members of the public, and members of the committee. My name is Noel Kabakub, and I am the planner assigned to process and review the assigned subject application. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and seek feedback on the application filed by 2768197 Ontario Inc. and their consultants, Glen Shinar and Associates Inc. Next slide, please. The subject property is located in Ward 6, municipally known as 8195 Winston Churchill Boulevard in the southwest part of Brampton. The subject property is located north of Steeles Avenue West and east of Winston Churchill Boulevard. Next slide, please. Surrounding land uses include to the north, two residential dwellings and the industrial uses known as Maple, known as Maple Lodge Farms. To the west are residential dwellings and agricultural land beyond that, uh, which is also located in the town of Halton Hills or Halton Region. To the south is a retail industrial building and beyond that is also agricultural land, and to the east is additional agricultural land. It shall be noted that immediately to the south of the retail industrial building, a rezoning application has been approved, which permits some expanded uses to, for the Maple Lodge Farm Chicken Shop to include a factory outlet and special event storage building. More recently, an application for site plan approval has been submitted for the said, said property for Maple Lodge Farms and the associated rezoning application. Next slide, please. Above you have some site photos from a recent site visit. From left to right, you are looking at the front of the property, you're looking southeast, focusing on the access point as well as the dwelling. The middle is looking is at the rear of the property, also looking southeast where the proposed tractor trailer parking is. And the final picture is also from the front looking east, notifying that the notification sign has been posted 20 days in advance of this public meeting. Next slide, please. This is the proposal. I know it's rather small, so if you can go to the next slide, I've included a larger image for a little bit more clarity. So going from left to right, there are the proposal is 20 vehicular parking spaces, the repurposing of the existing dwelling for office use with a total gross floor area of 454 square meters. To the rear is 56 tra tractor trailer parking spaces of the existing building. There's also a landscape open space at the rear of the property. And it should be noted that there's also a chain link fence surrounding portions of the property, as well as a sliding gate near the rear of the existing building to allow for access for the truckers, tractors and trailers. This does require an amendment to the zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. The official plan designation is currently industrial and open space. Some permitted uses under the, predominantly the industrial is manufacturing, distribution, as well as a self-storage warehouse. As per section 5.10, temporary use bylaws of the Brampton official plan, policy 5.10.3 states that temporary use bylaws may be passed without the necessity of amending the official plan, provided the use is temporary, which utilizes largely existing or temporary buildings and structures and does not require the extensive construction of permanent buildings or structures or the significant alteration of land to accommodate the temporary use. No amendments to the official plan or secondary plan are required for this application. Next slide, please. The secondary plan designation is predominantly highway and service commercial as well as standard industrial. The uses under highway and service commercial are as follows, office, retail and service uses, as well as retail warehousing among others. Next slide, please. The 
The zoning bylaw is currently agricultural A and allows for non-agricultural as well as agriculture uses. The non-agricultural uses being single detached dwelling, supportive housing type one and two, as, as some others, and some accessory purposes. Next slide, please. The current zoning bylaw amendment is proposed for changing the zoning from an agricultural A to industrial two, M2. As shown, the graphic the applicant has proposed to temporarily permit industrial uses, including outdoor storage, non-industrial uses, as well as accessory uses. Staff are still reviewing the proposal, and if, and if found supportable, staff will work in collaboration with internal departments, as well as the applicant, to draft the temporary zoning bylaw to accompany the future recommendation report. Next slide, please. The subject application. The subject application is being reviewed for consistency with the Planning Act, the Provincial Policy Statement, and conformity with the Provincial Growth Plan and other relevant policies, as well as the Regional and Municipal Official Plans, and following the principles of the 2040 Vision, as well as the Brampton Plan, the new Official Plan Review. Next slide, please. At this time, staff note there are a number of concerns or areas of opportunities for us and the applicant to address. For the first being there are potential noise impacts on the adjacent residential dwellings to the north. Two, the current proposal is encroaching into the floodplain. Three, a photometric plan or a digital survey of, uh, of the site with proposed light solutions is currently left outstanding. Four, the proposed zoning includes additional uses that are not part of the current proposal. Again, staff will review the appropriateness of the future zoning designation in the forthcoming recommendation report. Next slide, please. The application was filed with the city and deemed complete on March 22nd, 2022, and it was then circulated for commenting by the departments and external agencies. Public notice of this meeting was sent out in the newspaper on April 21st, 2022. And the next steps in this application are for staff to continue the review of the application, including review from this uh, tonight's meeting, as well as technical comments that are left outstanding. Advance a final recommendation report for council for decision. Issues raised will be addressed in the recommendation report and staff will contact those, those residents who have spoken, written in, or advised an interest in monitoring the proposal. And then, of course, an appeal period, depending on the council's decision, is left there as well. Next slide, please. The report associated with tonight's meeting is available online. The presentation will be available online shortly. The final recommendation report will be posted on the city's website in advance of the future meeting. And should you require more information on the, on the application, you may contact either myself or the applicant. My contact information there is, again, my name is Noel Kubaku, and the applicant is Colin Chung of Lynch Learn Associates, representing the owner. That concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions if needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any delegations? Through you, Mr. Chair, there are no registered delegations. I'm just going to check the audience. I do not see anybody, and there is the added correspondence distributed after the start of the meeting, 11.5, from Ganyar Walker Domes regarding this item. Okay, so I, I see no questions, and uh, I guess I have a motion moved by Councillor Pileschi uh, to uh, move the staff report and additional correspondence. Is there anyone opposed? I see none. Motion carries. Uh, our next item is item 5.6. Application to amend the official plan and Main Street North Development Permit System Bylaw, SGL Planning and Design, Bristol Place Corp, to permit two 48 story mixed buildings containing residential commercial uses. Uh, I will now hand it over to Carmen Caruso. Welcome, Carmen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, member, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee and everyone attending this public meeting this evening. My name is Carmen Caruso and I'm the planner assigned to process and evaluate this application to amend the official plan and the development permit system bylaw. The application was sub submitted by SGL Planning and Design Inc. on behalf of Bristol Place Corp. Through this presentation, I'll be providing some of the technical back background and a brief overview of the policy context asso associated with this proposal and I will also be, uh, be outlining some of the preliminary issues that will need to be addressed as part of this application. Please note that as outlined in the public meeting notice, the Planning and Development Committee will not make a decision this evening. 
And the purpose of this meeting is to provide residents with information with respect to the proposal and seek public feedback. A decision in support of or in opposition to this application will be made at a later date. Next slide, please. The site is generally located at the northwest corner of Market, uh, Market Street and Main Street North. It's bounded by Main Street North to the east, Market Street to the south, um, Thomas Street to the west, and the properties located on David Street to the north. Uh, the site is basically known as two, sorry, 199 to 221 Main Street North, 34 and 40, 40, 34 to 44 Thomas Street and 4 Market Street. Next slide, please. Uh, so in the area, the subject site is currently occupied by 10 buildings that are residential buildings or residential buildings that were converted to commercial buildings. To the south of the site is a designated heritage, uh, heritage resource. Um, Market Street and south of Market Street is a higher density, a higher density residential building. To the west and to the north are low rise, low density residential neighborhoods. To the east are a mix of low rise commercial and residential buildings. And also in the vicinity, in the vicinity are um, institutional uses, the downtown Brampton GO station and parking lot, and near the GO station another high density residential building. Next slide, please. As noted, the applicant has submitted an application to amend the official plan and the Main Street North Development Permit System, a bylaw. Specifically, the applicant is proposing to develop the lands with two 48-story towers with approximately 1,149 dwelling units, including 602 one-bedroom, 535 two-bedroom, and 12 three-bedroom units. The applicant is also proposing 1,638 square meters of, uh, of commercial floor, floor area, one access point from Thomas Street, and 466 below grade parking spaces. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The property is designated central area in the official plan and is within the urban growth center. Policies in the official plan require growth be concentrated on lands within these designations, accommodating a significant portion of population and employment. Lands within the central area and urban growth center are preferred locations for investment and intensification, permitting a full range of office, retail, commercial, and service activities, as well as a wide range of residential and institutional uses. The official plan also shows that this property is located within, anchor, within an anchor mobility hub. Lands within the anchor mobility hub are expected to be developed for transit supportive densities and a built form designed to foster a pedestrian friendly environment, accommodating the highest combined people and jobs per hectare with a, within the urban growth center. Buildings within the anchor mobility hub are expected to, to be designed to achieve a combined floor space index of four over the entire area, and buildings are anticipated to be greater than four stories in height. An amendment to the city's main official plan document is not required to facilitate this proposal. Next slide, please. Uh, the property is designated Main Street North Development Permit System Area in the downtown Brampton Secondary Plan. The, policy, the policies in the secondary plan provide the, the enabling structure for the development permit system bylaw. New investment and modest intensification is supported for lands within this designation while maintaining the, and enhancing the existing character of Main Street North. The, cap, the applicants are proposing to update the existing policies to facilitate the proposal. A secondary plan amendment to the official plan is required. Uh, next slide, please. The property is located in an area regulated by the Main Street North Development per Permit System Bylaw, also known as the DPS Bylaw. The DPS Bylaw shows that the site is located within a medium density transition character sub-area, which is intended to provide the transition between the lower density neighborhood to the north of the site and more intense uses to the south. 
The site is located in a district that allows a wide range of residential, commercial, institutional uses and allows a ma maximum building heights between 15.5 to 30 meters. An amendment to the Main Street North Development Permit System bylaw is required to permit the proposed development. Next slide, please. At this time, the following issues have been noted. The appropriateness of the heightened density and transition proposed by the applicant and the impact on the surrounding neighborhoods, including heritage properties, will be reviewed as part of the application and it will include an evaluation of this proposal against the existing policy framework. Matters of wind and shadows will be analyzed. The location and adequacy of the proposed site uh, sorry, the proposed site access point in relation to the vehicular trips generated will be evaluated. At this stage, it is unclear how the land to the north that fronts onto David Street can be developed in the, in the future in a reasonable manner or whether the approval of this development will sterilize these properties. Other matters that will be evaluated include the adequacy of community services such as schools, parks, community centers, libraries, and other municipal amenities, the appropriateness of the location of privately owned public accessible open space, and the appropriateness of road widenings, daylight triangles, building setbacks, and drop-by areas. Next slide, please. The application will be evaluated against provincial and municipal policies, including those found in the Planning Act, the Provincial Policy Statement, the Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the Region of Peel Official Plan, the City of Brampton Official Plan, the Downtown Brampton Secondary Plan, as well as the high-level principles of the Brampton 2040 Vision. Next slide, please. This slide indicates the steps that have occurred with respect to the review of this application and the future steps on the, in the evaluation process. Staff is reviewing the application material and documentation submitted to determine completeness. The application has been circulated to city departments and external agencies for comments and meetings as needed will be held with staff, agencies and the applicant to ensure issues relating to this application are understood. The notice of the public open house and statutory public meeting, both requirements under the Planning Act, was sent out on April 11th, 2022, and published in the Brampton Guardian on April 14th. The virtual public open house was held on May 9th, 2022, and today we are at the statutory public meeting uh, part of this application. For the next steps, uh, staff will continue to assess the application by analyzing and evaluating comments and issues that are raised at tonight's meeting by residents that make representation uh, before committee, as well as analyzing and evaluating comments that were received from submitted correspondence from residents, city departments, and external agencies. The applicant is pursuing the, an approval of this application through the Minister's Zoning Order. For this proposal, as a, as a result, the remaining steps are dependent on two possible paths. First, if the Minister's Zoning Order that establishes land use requirements and restrictions on the site is issued by the province. Staff will work towards the review of the detailed design of the proposal where we will look at specifics of site design, including building location, building materials, location of walkways, types and location of landscaping, and the appropriateness of facilities of, for persons with dis disabilities. Note that if the zoning order does proceed, there is no mechanism to appeal the proposed amendment to the official plan and development permit system bylaw. The second path, which is the more traditional path and will occur if a minister's zoning order is not issued for this application. In this case, once a comprehensive review has been completed, staff will prepare a recommendation report for consideration by council. Any issues raised through the review of this application, including any issues raised this evening, will be addressed in a recommendation report. Anyone who has provided their contact information at tonight's meeting or through correspondence relating to this file will be notified before the community the recommendation report is considered by council. If a minister's zoning order is not issued, any decision of the council makes in support of or in opposition to this proposal can be appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Next slide, please. 
The information report and correspondence associated with tonight's meeting is available online at www.brampton.ca on the City Hall Meetings and Agendas page. This presentation will also be available online uh, shortly. Again, my name is Carmen Caruso. If you have any questions, please, please feel to contact me or David Riley, the, the applicant for this application. Uh, the, con uh, the contact information is shown on the slide. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. City Clerk, do you have any public delegations? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes. There are a number of uh, registered public delegations, and there may be others of per persons attending in the chambers this evening. Uh, also, I just wish to point out that representatives from the applicant are present, should there be any questions for clarification of the applicant. So we will start with calling forward uh, Constance Lout and Stefan Lout. If they are registered, they can come forward. Um, I do not see them present. Uh, the next uh, registered delegate is Cynthia Rochefort. If Cynthia is here. Don't see Cynthia. Uh, the next registered delegate is Christopher Moon. Uh, Christopher is present. Christopher is coming down to the podium. And just to also advise committee that there is correspondence regarding this item identified as 11.1 on tonight's agenda. And Christopher, you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Thank you, Mr. Clerk, and uh, I hope I'm not begging indulgence to extend, but I have remarks that I think are necessary to be made with this application. I'm chair of the trustee board of Grace United Church at 156 Main Street North, and for those who may not be familiar, that church is the church with the tall spire just north of the bridge. The proposed uh, development is less than 200 meters from the church. And to give you some perspective about my comments for the benefit of those who don't know, I'm going to tell you a little about Grace United Church. It is the oldest continuously operating organization in Brampton. It was founded in 1822. This is its 200th anniversary. There wasn't even a town here when the congregation first started to meet. They built the current church <clears throat> in the year of Confederation, 1867. It's uh, one of Brampton's most historic buildings. It is a beautiful, uh, oak and cedar sanctuary and it's been lovingly maintained by its members through the centuries. The church, the members of the church also have been a source of community leadership throughout these 200 years. Members have included at least two past mayors of Brampton and a premier of Ontario. It is Bill Davis Family Church. But it's a church that's moved with the times to make our community a better place. For instance, in the 1980s there was a vast need for seniors housing. There was really none. Grace Church stepped up and built Grace Court Seniors Residence on Scott Street that continues to be filled today with people needing that accommodation. Now, now today it's a church, it's an inner city church. The neighborhood has changed dramatically. Many of the residents are marginalized and among the poorest in Brampton. The church responded by creating Grace Place Community Resource Center in this uh, last two decades and it is the home of Regeneration Outreach Community and many other community organizations. I will tell you that today, approximately 200 people had free breakfast and lunch there who would not necessarily otherwise have eaten. This is why Grace Church is known as the church with a heart in the heart of the city. So why the history lesson? Well, it's simply to stand as evidence that generation after generation, Grace United Church has stepped up for the betterment of Brampton. We're not here for short term or personal gain. When it comes to development, the church has actually been a proponent of good development in the area. When the medallion apartment building across the street on Main Street was built, when the initial plan was put in, it was very sterile. We sat down with the builders and who were very accommodative and they built a beautiful, historically appropriate looking building in the neighborhood, a credit to what can happen in Brampton when we put our mind to building good development. There's been a proposal for a development at the corner of Main and Church for 30 stories, and we haven't opposed to that. We just want it to be appropriate for the neighborhood. There is a uh, universally acknowledged need for rent geared to income housing in Brampton. And this is an area where it is particularly needed. We submit that rent geared to income should, accommodation should and must be part of any development of this scale. So that brings us to this 48-story uh, apartment project. 
And I must say, without exception, every person to whom I've, I've spoken about this development says words to the effect of, this is ridiculous. We agree and are opposed to the development proceeding as proposed. The project is of a scale and density that is unprecedented in Brampton, much less the historic Main Street North area. As residents, we think we have the right to request that the city be developed in a manner that is consistent and compatible with other development. If this proceeds, it'll be a precedent for other developments of a similar nature. It's also out of character for other developments that are being proposed or already approved in the downtown, most of which are in the 25 to 30 story range. And uh, what's being built looks good and I think it's just great. But this one will be a very odd looking outlier. It will dominate the skyline of Brampton. When you think of the skyline of Toronto, you think of the CN Tower. When you think of Mississauga, you think of the Marilyn Monroe buildings. When you look at Brampton, you'll see two toothpicks. Not exactly what a forward-looking, vibrant city wants to present as its image. And you'll see them from miles and miles away. Christopher, you have 30 seconds. Thank you. So the area lacks all of the public amenities that are required to support this and number of people. I also want to just spend the last minute or so on the ministerial zoning order. Uh, when you approve a ministerial zoning order as council, you abdicate your responsibility to us, the residents, to make decisions in our benefit, and you hand it over to the minister, so it's not your problem anymore. I suggest to you that's entirely wrong. This is a very serious development, and the, the approval you gave should be withdrawn. And I say that in part because the motion that adopted the approval of the ministerial zoning order referred to 1,129 units and 1,092 parking spaces. The application is submitted as for 1,149 units and 466 parking spaces. I don't know who's trying to fool who here, but what you approved isn't what's being applied for. I think I'll end there. Um, other than to say, we really want to see good development, and this really is not good development. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christopher. The next registered delegate is Deborah Bergaman. Deborah is joining us virtually, and Deborah, you are in the session. You can unmute your mic, and you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your uh, time here this evening. Um, I've been a resident of Brampton since 1967 and I live on Church Street now. It's an area that I purposely waited for a unit to come up to, and I purchased it before I even sold my previous home in Brampton. So I am absolutely committed to this area that I live in on Church Street. I love it, and I'm, I support proper and good development of the area. We know development is necessary. We know densification and repurposing of property helps contribute to a vibrant community. But I do have four points of concern with this building and this application process. First of all, the height of this building at 48 stories times two. The density just seems outrageous. The building that has been applied for at the corner of Church and Main is 30 stories. So we're talking about 18 stories above a 30-story building which is yet to be built. The ratio of parking that's, that's being discussed is unreasonable. Parking, if not sufficient in the area or having available municipal lots, it's going to compound us as property owners where people will come with their vehicles and park on the streets wherever, wherever they see a vehicle will fit, they'll park there. That's left to the existing residents and community and business owners to deal with. It's not reasonable that during the public open house, it was discussed and said that parking will sort itself out. It will not sort itself out because we still are a community that relies on people coming with vehicles to either deal with groceries, to deal with deliveries, to have visitors, and without sufficient parking in the area, we're going to be compounded. Talk about the height of the building and the, the visible structure. The light pollution and the, uh, the impact and the negative impact this will have in, of birds in our community. We know that the 
difficulties that birds have navigating through buildings that are lit up in night. It changes their migration patterns and causes often causes them to just die. It's something that I don't think any of us want to experience here. We know it's happened in several cities and I think there's things we can do to prevent it. I noticed in the study that was committed, there was no comments about what they would do to bird mitigation. So I, I'm disappointed to see that from the developer. In addition to the over insufficient parking, the over densification of this area, living on Church Street and seeing a, an application for a 30 story unit at uh, the corner of Church and Main, the two 48 story units, and then down at the other end of Church and Beach, there's a 10 story unit with a number of um, with a number of townhouses talked about, uh, in addition to the river walk. Right now, trying to get out of the, the apartment that I live in on Church Street is a difficult task at the best of times, as is the traffic flow on Church and Main. That, that is, is my concern with the number of vehicles, the construction and everything that's gonna happen in the area. I don't know if applications are looked at independently or as a whole, but the amount of densification in this area is concerning to me. But my last point that I wanted to make is why was this application not processed through the usual process? Why were they permitted to go to the uh, minister's zoning order? And, and at this point, if that is approved, um, how can things be, be uh, looked at? So I would I would ask council to consider keeping Brampton in a in a positive light and looking forward to uh, not making impacts that are long standing into the future. That's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Deborah. Thank the you, next, Deborah. The next, the next registered speaker is Rob Granger. Rob is also joining us virtually. Rob, you can unmute your mic, and you have up to five minutes to address the committee. So Rob, you can go ahead and unmute your microphone. So Rob, um, uh, Tammy, can you unmute uh, Rob's microphone? There we go. Uh, Rob, are you there? Rob, your microphone is unmuted, but we are not hearing you at the moment. So uh, Tammy, if you can mute, uh, mute um, Rob's microphone. Rob, if you can try and um, configure your microphone to the WebEx uh, platform. In the meantime, we'll go on to the next registered delegate and we'll come back to you. Uh, Jennifer McCutcheon is the next registered delegate. Jennifer, you are in the session and you can unmute your mic and you have up to five minutes to address the committee. And can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Okay. So again, um, this is the largest development in Brampton. This is 48 stories times two. Um, we're not looking at a low rise, we're not looking at a mid rise, we're not looking at a high rise, we are looking at skyscrapers. With the DPS system, we were told it was going to be a maximum of nine stories in that area. You are now doing that times five, times two. This area is already giving the Rogers Center with 200,000 square foot facilities. It is giving um, numerous builds at this point. Um, we were told, and in Mississauga they have this, uh, that we would be going from high density to low density. But what's happening now as we go from the train tracks, we have a 30 story, we have 20 story builds to a 30 story build to approximately um, a 14 story build to 11 story build, back up to two 48 story builds down to two story residential occupied family houses. We are not NIMBY, we are not against infill and proper design and everything. This is not proper design. You are squeezing a gigantic skyscraper into an established two-story neighborhood. You're zoning your Vision 2040 said we are, and it's on your thing, we are the existing neighborhood and we're existing neighborhood retained. But we're not retained, you're sticking a skyscraper into our area. And this is a different skyscraper because this is three, 
three of the four sides of these buildings are facing residential, not just facing, they're on top of residential, which means not only do I no longer have privacy on the front, but I no longer have privacy on the side of my house, on the back of my house. And not only it's my neighbors that are now looking down on me, but now it's strangers that come to visit the apartment. It's people that are having parties on that terrace that is between four and six um, stories high. You are overlooking everybody's land. Parking, 466, that's 0.4, I was told, for buildings those sizes. The buildings beside it, when they were originally built, they were talking about not putting an underground parking at all because transit and uh, the train station would take care of it. Well, right now, if you go and ask them, um, visitor parking is at a premium. Not to mention, my son can't walk out on Main Street because we have cars going every which way onto sidewalks, through fences, crashing, um, and then taking out pedestrians left, right, and center, for which I've done CPR on. So my kid can't use that. So now he can't even go into the back, um, back way safely because now I have cars w racing through. We're going to have a wall of development coming at us, a wall. I don't understand. You, you work at City Hall. When you come out for your breaks, when you come out after work, you see that traffic. It is at a standstill. When they get to us, they are now racing and doing some dangerous stuff just to get through the red light. The red light is a suggestion now. Stop signs are non-existent. And you're putting a skyscraper to us. I also have an issue with the fire. Um, right now, just recently, Toronto Fire has bought the first one in North America, a ladder that can only reach 22 stories. It's the largest ladder, only up to 22 stories. These stories are 48. Now, we could get that one. It would take us 46 kilometers from Queen's Quay, and if traffic is good, it's about 40 minutes, 44 minutes to get here. But this is different. This is a skyscraper going right on to residential, right on to residential. So if we have a flame coming from a barbecue or a lit cigar or whatever, and it comes floating down, there is no buffer. We have absolutely no buffer in the area. So we have no problem, a low rise, mid rise appropriate. But these buildings, this size is not even in your uptown design. It's not, well, not yet. It's not in your downtown. The apartments right beside the train stations are smaller than the ones out here on the outskirts, which again, Mississauga understands. And your old DPS and your uh, Vision 2040 was to taper down. Jennifer, you have 30 seconds. Thank you very much. I am also having a problem with light pollution, sky shadowing. Um, yes, yeah, safety with things flying off the balconies. Um, uh, just, there's so many things. This is not affordable housing. This is what Ontario wanted. They want affordable housing. These are luxury micro condominiums. There is nothing affordable about these houses or these condos. They're not going to be rented out. But when they are, you will have to get back your 500000 for the small micro unit and your maintenance fees. So you're not supporting the elderly. Imagine in a blackout trying to get an elderly or disabled person from the top stories down in a 48-story double twin tower. So right now, um, they're beautiful buildings. They are not appropriate for this area. They're appropriate for your other areas of Brampton, your Vision 2040. I'm, I'm shocked and awed that I had to find out through a Facebook ad <laughs> that this was happening, eight, store, eight doors down from my property. But this, this has no business being in this area. I am no problem for infill and fixing the downtown up. They've let them rot for so long. We are a established neighborhood with people and families. We are a complete neighborhood. Even the developers have said we are a complete neighborhood. So by throwing this gigantic, a gigantic beast in the middle of it, you are destroying our fabric. We talk to each other. Paul knows this from the injection site. You know who I am. We all talk to each other. There is no going to be talking to neighbors 48 stories above us. 
there will be no community. We have the community. We look out for each other. We keep the crime away. We look out for the homeless people. We are here. You need to be here for us. And you, as our counselors, need to be here for us. There's more things than money. I understand it's a money thing. I understand the more units, the better it is. I understand all that, but this is ridiculous for this area. You have apartment buildings and condos going up everywhere else where they're situated perfectly. To put it on top houses is not safe. And again, going back to the fire, again, going back to the traffic, these are micro units. This is a condo build. This is not affordable housing by any means. The size to the other ones is ridiculous. It's a disjointed vision of going up and down, up and down. There is no planning to this. Jennifer, this will... you've, you've exceeded the five minutes. If you could wrap up. Thank you very up, much. Have a good Thank you. Uh, I'll go back to Rob Granger just to see Rob. Can we, have we, um, can you unmute your microphone? Hi, Rob. We're still not able to hear you, Rob. So we're going to put you back on mute and we'll try again. In the meantime, uh, John Holman is present and John is in the chambers and he, John, you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Mr. Chair, council members, city staff, my name's John Holman. Um, I reside probably about 40 meters away from where this proposed building is going to be built. I'm on 8 Alexander Street. Um, I just want to touch base on a couple of things. Much like Mr. Moon, thank you very much for being so eloquent. Um, there, we do have some concerns. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, probably about 2007, I was one of the co-chairs with the Downtown Brampton Residents Association with Mr. Andrew DeGroote. The two of us worked closely with the city, the planning staff, in making sure certain design elements were brought forward in the landmark, that it wasn't just a concrete building, that it took into account heritage design elements in regards to the building that it replaced. Some of the concerns we have is in regards to the height, the wind study, shadowing of the building, the downtown Brampton secondary plan designation, the planning justification report. Uh, we're looking at parking for both residents. Um, very light. There's no parking for if they're doing a retail component. There's nothing available for that. And the daycare, there'll be no parking for that. Uh, we've seen what's happened with the landmark where it has struggled ever since its inception to have some kind of a mixed commercial component to that building. It's finally received a medical profession that's in there. Some of the other concerns are the consistency and conformity, the height massing, density, and the Main Street North development plan. So just to talk briefly, um, when we talked about what was going to happen with the downtown core probably back in 2007, we took a look at the Main Street North plan. And it was um, I wouldn't say decided, but it was being developed that the Main Street North plan would be somewhere between seven to nine stories with development of a higher rise at the gateway to the downtown core coming down Main Street North. And that area, which is supposed to have a higher density, higher building, is around the Main Street North and the Vauden Street area. The problem that we have with this building is when we talk about height, and many people have brought that forward, if I use this laptop as a prop, if I put that in this room, in the center of this floor, to the ceiling, this laptop's to scale to what a second story house is to that building. So that kind of gives you a representation as to the overshadowing of this building. I invite you to take a look at the absolute towers. Go into Google Map, take a look and see where the closest residential component is other than the apartment buildings. You're gonna see it's at least a kilometer away. So the problem that we have here with that is the shadowing of these two buildings reaches far out. And our house, which we bought in 1998, and we're part of, let's call the gentrification of the Main Street North area, we're going to be in a shadow for each of these shadow plans for approximately five hours. Now that's not the intention of why we bought the house. 
nor the people on Ellen Street, Alexander Union Church. We're also taking a look at the wind studies that have been provided. Um, I'm not a wind expert, but when you take a look at the wind study that was provided as part of the background, there's some pretty strong winds that are going to be happening down Main Street. And they're going to be anywhere from 50% to 70% of the velocity of the winds right now, depending on the time of the season. Attributed to the modeling that they used when they took a look at how this high rise is going to be built. Um, as, a, as part of the wind study, they're also taking a look at what will the building do to mitigate some of the, the wind around the building? And they're talking about putting canopies over the entrances, recessed doors back. They're looking at um, different elements that they're going to use because they know there's going to be strong winds that are going to be coming off of this. The southwest corner they've already identified as one of the worst sites, as well as the northeast, as well as the bus shelter across on the southeast side of Main Street, just up from Grace United Church. They're recommending that a three-tier or three-wall bus shelter be put in there to help mitigate some of the loss. So I could go on. I know I got five seconds left. Um, but there's a lot that we have to take a look at before this plan actually gets approved. And I'm hoping that the government, the, the provincial government, doesn't step up to the plate and take the power away from not only the citizens of Brampton, but you are elected officials and our planning staff. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you, John. The, I'll go back uh, one last time to Rob Granger. Rob, we're gonna unmute your mic and see if you've rectified your audio connection. Uh, so Tammy, if you can go ahead and unmute. Rob, are you there? So Rob, we're not able to hear you. So what I'm going to suggest, if you do have comments on this, you can submit them to the city clerk's office uh, via the email that you communicated with the city with, and we'll make sure that they're provided to council at Wednesday's council meeting. So if you can send an email with your comments, if you have any uh, by tomorrow, that would be appreciated. We'll now move on to the next registered delegate, which is uh, Teresa Wisniewski. Teresa is in the chambers and will be coming forward to the podium. I'm Teresa Wisniewski, I live on David Street, and uh, my concerns uh, for the uh, uh, two Bible Towers uh, are uh, increased traffic. Um, uh, I don't know if you're uh, considering uh, flying cars for uh, the city of Brampton, because it seems to me uh, so unreasonable. Right now, uh, Main Street and Church Street are very high with the traffic, so how are you gonna consider um, two high rises in front of the Main Street and Church Street, and uh, uh, where's the traffic gonna go? Next uh, point is a potential for storm water issue, potential for flooding, Problems with water drainage, already we have every single year problem with water drainage. After, after the winter, every single year we have a construction on our street and there is a problem with the, the water drainage. So I don't know how you're gonna resolve this. All the trees around the area due to the construction they all are gonna die. The same goes for uh, the birds and wildlife that is around. There's gonna be none, nothing left. This is a visual intrusion on peace and privacy of everybody that lives in the uh, village of Brampton. This is a village. So keep it as a village. The home values will diminish. Existing houses will be damaged due to, due to the ongoing construction. With the pounding, all the houses gonna suffer around. 
Where is the uh, protection for historic and heritage of the village-like neighborhood for this area? Protection for the families, especially with the children and elderly. There is gonna be increase of the noise and odor in the area. There is gonna be a crime threats and last, parking issues. Parking issue already exists in this area. So I, I don't know how you're gonna resolve this. And uh, hopefully, uh, Minister of uh, uh, Zoning will uh, consider the neighborhood. This is a village style neighborhood. And I can tell you, I have friends from Mississauga, from Toronto, they coming here especially for a little walk around Brampton because it's so beautiful. So leave it as it is. Don't build the two toothpicks in front of the faces of the um, neighborhood. Thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa. The next registered delegate was uh, Mara Antilla. Um, Mara, or Mari, sorry, is not present this evening. Uh, so that's the end of the registered delegates. Is there anybody else present who would like to come forward to speak to committee on this item? Just looking around the chamber to see if anybody wishes to come forward to speak. And I don't see anybody else. So Mr. Chair, that concludes the delegations for tonight's meeting. And we do have correspondence uh, 11.1 regarding this item. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from members of committee? Uh, I see none. So I do have a motion moved by uh, Councillor Vicente. Uh, and the motion is to uh, move uh, receipt of the staff report uh, and um, take it as read, including uh, the delegations uh, and correspondence. Is there anyone opposed? I see none. Motion carries. Uh, we now move on to public delegations we dealt with. Uh, I believe now we are on our next item is 6.2. Uh, 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 delegations regarding item 7.2, application to amend the zoning bylaw, Sukman Raj, Corbett Land Strategies, 58 Jesse Street, Ward 3. Uh, and I believe we have three delegations, and I will ask the clerk to introduce the delegates. Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, there were three registered delegates for tonight's, uh, this item for tonight. Uh, Megan Bennett, uh, Jonah Bell Sarumuga, and Dennis and Ruth Taylor. Um, Jonah Bell has requested to go last. Um, so Megan Bennett had indicated that she wished to delegate, but then uh, indicated to the clerk's office earlier today she could not attend. We do see her in the session. Um, so, Tammy, uh, we're just going to bring Megan in. Megan, do you still wish to address committee on this item, or do you wish your correspondence to speak for itself? You can unmute your mic. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Do you wish to address committee, Megan? Um, I, I did send an email. I, I, I just, I have a cold right now, so I'm going to be coughing on and off. I don't want <laughs> that to be a disturbance. That's fine then, Megan. We do have your correspondence. It is before committee okay. and they, it will be part of the public meeting record. Okay, then, th then that's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Dennis and Ruth Taylor. I, yeah, uh, they are in chambers and uh, Dennis is going to be coming forward to address um, committee on this matter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the council. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I'm sorry I'm slow. I'm not as fast as I once was. Um, the uh, plan for development of 58 Jesse Street uh, seems to be a, a way and above what is normally found in and around Jesse Street. Uh, Jesse Street is a neighborhood, 
people talk to one another, they visit with one another. Not everybody knows everybody, but everybody helps. Um, we've had people come and uh, shovel snow for us. They've, they've helped with uh, fallen trees and, and, and everything. So it is a neighborhood. Uh, some 80 people signed um, a petition uh, basically saying that they did not want this development. Uh, and it, it seems to me the input from the, the residents appears to have very little impact. Um, what, will be, uh, what will be the impact of our neighborhood if this project goes through? Will we experience a loss of power and water at times? What about telephone and internet services that rely on underground cables? Where would the necessary machinery to do the work be parked? Um, we're talking about two streets, Jesse Street and Haggard Street. Where are they going to park the machinery? Jesse Street ends in a dead end. How do people get out if they're blocked? And that's one of the things that comes out. Um, it's proposed that when these uh, townhouses are built, that the vehicles will enter off Jesse Street and exit onto Haggard Avenue. It is a challenge to turn from Haggard onto Queen Street at certain times, uh, particularly if attempting to turn left. It is possible that vehicles would turn from Haggard back onto Jesse and proceed to McMurchie. Again, it is a challenge at times turning onto McMurchie as vehicles are heading to the light to turn onto Queen Street. Um, more vehicles would add to these challenges. In addition, we have heard that vehicles that wish to make a right onto McMurchie find that it is a very tight turn and will often turn onto Haggard to Jesse and follow it over to McMurchie. This can include emergency vehicles. Unfortunately, many vehicles blow through the stop sign at Haggard uh, and at Jesse before turning onto Jesse. With this um, great building or monolith, they will not even see the vehicles coming along Jesse, which has the right of way. Um, most homes on this street are bungalows with a few two-story homes. Balconies for this development will be on the second or third level. This means that they will be able to look straight into neighbors' yards, giving one the impression of living in a fishbowl. Um, when talking to the developers group, they were asked where the children in these townhouses will play. It was suggested that they could play in Jesse Park at the west end of the street. This is a park in name only. They came, they put a sign up, said, this is Jesse Park, and nothing else was done, except to lay a sewer line to promote the, the um, mall on the other side of the creek. Uh, it is actually the floodplain for that creek and it is often wet. In fact, it has long, if it has been a long, hard winter, when spring comes, the creek has flooded almost up to the street level. Uh, and in winter, some of the children skate in the field, and no water needs to be added to create a skating area. Is the city going to make it a park that is safe? Um, we have never considered it a safe place for our children or our grandchildren. Um, it is not safe for uh, children to play on Haggard Street. As I said, vehicles turning onto Haggard are often moving quickly, and that is why many go right through the stop sign. I am sure the argument will be made that Brampton is evolving, and over the years I've heard developers say they will get the kind of development they want. The problem is they do not live there. The neighbors that, that wrote and, and signed the, the, the protest basically do, and, and I think that's where I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, next is Jonah Bell. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, and members of the public. My name is Jonah Bosseramuga, a Senior Associate Development Planner uh, from Corbett Land Strategies, Inc., representing our client uh, who owns the land at Jesse Street, uh, 58 Jesse Street, and its um, proposed application for a zoning bylaw amendment to permit the six three-story townhouse units. I am here tonight to further encourage, through you, Mr. Mr. Chair, and members of the committee, to support the recommendation report by staff for the approval of the zoning bylaw amendment, as it represents good planning, as stated in the recommendation report. On behalf of the client, we would like to thank city staff for working with us to get this application together and for providing us the review comments and recommendations on how we can improve the proposed development on the site and to assist in addressing concerns received by residents in the area. Thank you again for the positive staff report. We look forward to working with staff towards um, ultimate uh, completion. Thank you. 
Thank you. And Mr. Chair, that concludes the registered delegates. We also have the correspondence, as, as was mentioned at the beginning, from uh, Megan Bennett, 11.4 uh, on today's agenda. Now, I do know there were some individuals that are attending in person that were interested in this item, if they wish to speak on this item. Um, I just want to make sure. Uh, committee will have to uh, reopen the agenda to add them as delegates to this item. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, we do see one person that has indicated their interest to speak. Uh, does the committee wish to reopen the agenda to allow this person to speak? I'm happy to support uh, reopening. Uh, members of the committee, uh, is there anyone opposed to uh, reopening? I see none. So, uh, City Clerk. So if that individual can come down to speak, and if you can just state your name for the record, please. Just take your time. My name is uh, Doris Wilson. Uh, my mother presently lives at 1 Haggard Avenue South. She's directly across the street from this uh, development and uh, her driveway is going to be facing the exit driveway to this uh, building. Uh, my concern is it's three stories. I don't think the design suits the neighborhood, but my main concern is um, the address is going to be Haggard Avenue, I believe, uh, going forward once it's done. And uh, where are the... Um, the garbage facility, like where's the garbage pickup going to be? At the front door, the driveway is all at the back. And uh, there is no room at the front of these buildings for three garbage bins at each six unit townhouse, right at the front door. And that's where they will be permanently, at the front door. Um, the garbage pickup has to be from the back at the driveway. It just cannot be at the front door. It'll be looking like a slum if that continues. Like, I mean, I've never heard of garbage pickup at the front door. And uh, it's very small property at the front. And uh, it needs to be addressed. And what about snow removal? Um, Who's responsible for the snow removal on this property? Where's the snow going? There's only six visitors uh, parking spots for six units, which isn't near enough. There is a parking problem on the street with the barber shop on the corner. They park all the way down to the stop sign on Haggard. Um, and they're going to be parked in front of these town homes. Um, but my main concern are the garbage, uh, the garbage bins at the front of the building. And it's a big concern because it's not very nice looking. You can add that to your drawing, the three garbage bins in front of each uh, unit, very unsightly. And that's all my concerns. And these are longtime neighbors. My, uh, my mother has lived in that house for uh, 65 years. And this is what's going to be across the road from her. Um, it's, it's not very nice. They're longtime neighbors, and uh, they don't need a big disruption like this. Anyways, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. And Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you. And just. Yes. Email. Oh. Um, yes, Please, uh, Mr. Chair, there is another person that wishes to speak. So with, count, with committees reopening to allow a, f a few delegates, I just wish to confirm, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Um, so Mr. Chair, this will be the last added speaker. And if you could just state your name for the record, and then after, your, after you speak, if you can sign into the, the book. Thank so you very much. My name is Duncan Gibson. I live at 70 Jesse Street, which is directly across the street from the proposed development. And uh, the issues that have been stated tonight by Doris and by Mr. Uh, whatever, uh, have been are things that I am very concerned about as well. But especially the three stories. 
anything in excess of two stories, if you put three, maybe four units of two stories high, I think it might be permissible. But three stories, six units of three stories on this dinky little property, it is going to present an awful lot of problems. And also, you, you talk about traffic and, and what have you. You've already approved the uh, condominium high rise on Gum Papers property with the stacked townhouses surrounding it, 403 units. There's only two possible ways to get out of this area, McMurchie or Queen Street. And uh, it, as, as Mr. Taylor said, getting out onto Queen Street is almost impossible and uh, it, it's difficult on McMurchie as well, especially if you're going north. Uh, it, it's just unreal. And I, I'm very concerned about the traffic, very concerned about the safety for the children that are going to be there, and I'm very concerned about the three stories. Please reduce it to two stories at least. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. And, oh, Mr. I just, I just need to ask a question. Okay. Is this been approved? So, sorry, Mr. Uh, sir, if you wish to ask a question sure. or to speak, please come down so it's on the part of the public record. So before uh, this person comes down to speak, is there anybody else who wishes to speak? I'm going to ask for the last time. And then after the speaker, the, the matter will be before committee. And this is the last speaker, Mr. Chair. And if you can just state your name for the record. And yeah, I'm Stu DL. I'm at uh, 54 Jesse Street, which is two lots down from this proposal. Uh, the sharing of information, uh, you spelt my name wrong. But anyway, the sharing of information hasn't been very ideal on this situation. And we we're under the impression before we came here that this was a done deal. And, and listening to this delegation here, it, it seems like this. there's nothing we can do about this. Is this true? Uh, is there somebody can answer that question? Because every, all night there's been a planner up here until this came up. So we haven't heard anything from the planning department on the status of what's going on. So if the planner has something that they could tell us about, we can react to. It's pretty hard to ask a question when you don't know what the information is out there to ask about. So. Is it a done deal or is it not? Well, it, it's not, sir. This is uh, the chair of planning and one of the area councillors. Uh, it, it is not a done deal because council uh, has to, or committee has to vote on the report. Uh, what you were referring to is the statutory public meetings where we do have a planner uh, who does a presentation and they're there to take any questions of clarification. Uh, what we have here today is a staff report uh, that all members of committee have received and uh, also has been published uh, to the public. Uh, and we do have staff on call. If there's any questions that you would like to ask or members of the public or any members of committee, uh, they're available to answer any questions that you may have, uh, either clarification or, uh, or any comments that you want to make. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. We've been asking these questions for almost three years now and sitting in the back I just heard basically the the contractor whoever this delegation is they're thanking the planning committee is it we're thanking them for what if it's not been decided why are they thanking them for so having said that our counselor told us that it's almost a mute point for us to complain about something in our neighborhood the councillors cannot do anything if the municipal board overrules it. Well, Jesus Christ, doesn't that mean that we don't need councillors? If, if we can't put input into our own goddamn neighborhood, why are we here? I spent 42 years in the military, and we always fought for people's rights. Money is now taken over our rights so somebody can make some money. I've had it with that. 
and I don't think anybody in here would disagree with me that it's bullshit. Sorry for the language, I apologize, but that's what comes out of my mouth, and I'm done. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, I'll return the meeting back to you for consideration of this item. Oh, um, Mr. Chair, you're muted. My apologies. Um, uh, just in relation, I guess, to the last delegation, and I do know that sometimes there's complexity in our process. Um, I would just have, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for your service uh, uh, to our country through the military, and uh, uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, certainly, I think, to staff, if you can just outline uh, maybe uh, um, some of the process regarding, uh, I guess, um, uh, when it goes to the OMB, just to, I guess, to clarify uh, some of the understandings that uh, we will be voting on this uh, uh, right now. And But just before, uh, what are the options after uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the role of the Ontario Municipal Board? If staff can just briefly sort of comment, uh, just for clarification, uh, uh, so that residents understand that it's provincial legislation uh, and it's a provincial uh, body um, in terms of uh, right to appeal uh, and, uh, uh, and what some of that process and responsibilities are. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, to provide some general background information as it relates to that, and I, I think you know, information that the residents would, would appreciate here tonight that are, that are here uh, in the chambers and uh, yeah, at home listening in as well. Uh, with respect to the, the planning process that uh, really has uh, carried through up until this juncture here today. Um, the residents will recall that there was a, a public meeting that was had for this particular item where uh, there was ample notification uh, with respect to, to that application and, and that uh, event. And city staff, really, as identified by city council and decided by the city council, the, the notification that we do put out for those public meetings is uh, over and beyond and actually double what the, the planning act requires by, by the province. Uh, so really there, there has been engagement and we, we have received a, a number of uh, comments as it relates to this application and, and questions and such. Uh, staff had regarded all those questions and comments. We had also regarded the technical review uh, relating to the, the various documents and studies that were received with this application as well. And all that has culminated in uh, staff's recommendations uh, to committee and council on this development application. Uh, so with uh, this recommendation report that's with us tonight, this, this has been available for, for viewing by, by residents uh, for their uh, regarding as t in relation to making uh, any public delegations tonight uh, through to committee. Uh, and in that recommendation report, we have identified all the various questions and comments that we've received and we've responded to, to all of those in a, in a detailed fashion as well within one of the appendices within that, that report. So the, this report is being considered by a planning committee tonight. Uh, a, the decision rendered will be ratified at the next council meeting. And really at that point in time, uh, if it is that this application is approved, uh, the zoning bylaw uh, will be passed for the application as well. And with respect to uh, any potential uh, steps thereafter, if, if the application is approved, the residents uh, that may very well want to uh, appeal the matter, they, they could do so. Uh, if so, then the, the matter would be uh, proceeding through to the Ontario Land Tribunal. It was previously referred to as the OMB, some residents might recall. And it's uh, up there, uh, a provincial uh, body that refers to the matter, or refers to all the materials associated with it, and ultimately renders a decision. Uh, what, what I should also state, though, you know, with, with respect to the, the position that staff's put forward re recommending approval of this application tonight and all the various technical information. Some of the technical information that we have to regard as well is not only the, the studies which relate to parking, uh, you know, traffic, uh, urban design, engineering, but there, there is also policies that we have to regard. Not only the, the city's policies uh, with respect to the uh, official plan and the secondary plan that city council has adopted, but there's also critical documents uh, that are provincial le uh, legislation that we have to regard, uh, which are referred to as the, the places to grow, 
uh, and uh, the provincial policy statement. In, in those legislative documents, they, they outline some key considerations that the province puts to the municipalities. And that is uh, really that there, there is to be uh, efficient forms of development that are to be occurring within the city. And, uh, and really alongside the, the, the efficient reference that I have there is uh, some densification and urbanization that, uh, that is identified within those documents. So it's really important, very, very important, critical rather for uh, city staff and then ultimately committee and council to regard those legislative pieces which identify that within uh, areas that can handle some uh, additional development forms, urban areas, that intensification you know, does, uh, is considered uh, appropriately. And, and those would be then considerations that the Ontario Land Tribunal obviously would uh, really be looking at in a, in a key way as well, if it was that uh, any development applications are appealed. I should also state that if it was that council was to refuse this application tonight, the applicant uh, could very well appeal the matter to Ontario Land Tribunal as well. So I'll, perhaps I'll, I'll leave it there, uh, Mr. Chair, but let, let me know if you'd like me to provide any more information. No, that's great. Thank you, Alan. I think it's important to, uh, uh, especially uh, for residents' benefit, to just get a, a context of our decision-making within uh, uh, the layers of legislation and, and our obligations under the Municipal Act and uh, uh, specifically under the Planning Act. My apologies. Uh, so we will go now to our first speaker, Councillor Bowman. Sorry. So th through you, Mr. Chair, um, uh, a member of the, of the public just was asking about the report uh, and whether or not the report was available. They called into the clerk's office and was told that the report is available online, but they weren't no, on it. it's not available. She could not find it. Okay. I, I can assure you that it was published on May 6th. Um, I could not find it, and I could not find it. Okay. It, it is available, and it was published on May 6th. The city clerk didn't find it today. I am the city clerk. Because of the email I spoke to. So perhaps we can talk about that after, but I can t I can assure you that this report was published with the agenda on May 6. It's item 7.2 on today's agenda. Okay, she did not find yeah. it. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I believe that is it for the the speakers on this item. Um, in terms of public delegations, there is a speakers list right now. Thank you very much, and uh, my first speaker is Councillor Bowman. Thank you very much through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for coming to delegate. This has been going on quite a while. I can't even remember the first time I spoke to Mr. Gibson about this, uh, three years ago, I guess. Um, it's, it's a difficult position. I've lived my entire life here in Brampton. I know the area very well. I, uh, I grew up just off McMurchie and I lived on Haggard Street. For, for many years, Haggard Street North, of course. So uh, I know what the neighborhood is. I know the houses that are there, um, much like areas like Frederick Street, places like that. Um, so it's difficult when these decisions come up. We are bound by a, by a large number of, of uh, uh, Ontario directives as to what we can and what we can't do. Um, I, I'd like to focus Alan, if I could, on when we had the original meeting, there was a lot of asks, and, and they came back tonight again as far as garbage location, snow removal. What has been done, or, or Mr. Corbett, I don't know who can answer that, what has been done with all the questions that they had in the first meeting? Yeah, thank you. And through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with respect to the, the, the detailed maybe ask of uh, some descriptors as to what, what's changed, what we know in that detailed sense as it relates to the, the concept plan now, I'll, I'll pass it over to either David Vandenberg, manager for the, for the matter, or Rob Dinky Fortune, the, the assigned planner. But what, what I can also, though, maybe uh, just in advance of that uh, state, you know, through the councillor and, and all, all the councillors here, is that the, the matter will also go forward to uh, another 
development application being the site plan application where we will, together with the proponents, be looking at, uh, in a very detailed sense, uh, all of the, the details, physical elements uh, relating to the property. What, what we have received to date uh, for our ability in uh, progressing through the rezoning application has been a conceptual site plan. So there are, there are various changes that, that can occur, but yes, it does help us really arrive at whether you know, we believe a certain product is uh, in development is, is appropriate and such. Uh, but w with that, I'll, I'll pass it over. Okay, just, just before you do, Alan, so what you said was, this is, this is the application process if it gets passed by council um, on, on Wednesday at the council meeting. There still is a site plan application and future changes could possibly be made at the site plan application as well. Through you, Mr. Chairman, that, that, that's correct. So really what is uh, included within the recommendation report that's in front of uh, committee today is the conceptual site plan and so um, noting you know, various details as far as the intention of the, the build and various other elements, parking and such, the, the drive aisles, but, but yes, uh, that is conceptual to have uh, aided us in the processing of the application, but in a very um, uh, maybe further detailed sense and really with some change that could occur uh, between really what we've seen with this concept through to uh, what will be uh, looked at and maybe informed by some, some greater rigor and technical elements, yes, there, there will be a site plan application that, that could include some deviations. Okay. Yeah. Okay, through, <coughs> through the chair, the, the list of changes that the applicant has made since the public meeting are the following. So first was an increased setback from Justice Street. So originally 1.5 meters was proposed and that has been increased to 3.7 meters and that has been incorporated to the zoning bylaw. So that will have to be followed when the site plan does come forward. Um, the second change was there was comments about the design of the building and the fit with the neighborhood. So it was to revise the elevation design treatments and materials to lessen the building's vertical appearance and better integrate the, develop, the building with the surrounding community. And um, some examples of those renderings are included within the staff report as well. And this, this um, matter has been incorporated into the urban design brief, which is approved as part of the rezoning is really a fundamental document for guiding the site plan. So when the site plan does come in, that urban design brief, this has been incorporated into that document and will guide the site plan at that point. The third point um, was there was concerns about the functionality of the site in general for both parking, garbage collection, snow, snow storage, etc. Um, and through the changes since the public meeting, they revised that layout to improve that parking design and driveway design to improve functionality. And both city traffic staff and um, the region appeal are satisfied with it on a conceptual level. So essentially it works, it can function. Um, again, that will be further addressed as part of site plan finalized, but at a conceptual level, at this level it works. Um, and they also, the region also looked at garbage collection as well, identified that their solution was to have curbside collection, because I know that was an issue that was raised by the, by the residents. Um, and so there is a, the region who is responsible for garbage collection has identified the solution that works, um, and that again will be finalized as part of site plan. And the final thing is uh, an approved architectural design treatment of the corner unit that faces Jesse Street. Um, before it was in the initial submission was more of a blank wall and to there has been work done to improve the visual appearance of that of that side of the building. So those are the key changes that were made since the public meeting. Okay. Rob, do you have anything to add or uh, no, I wasn't I didn't know this application was late in the process and pre at the public meeting or at the, even the virtual uh, meeting that was held in April prior to that to bring other uh, interests out. So um, uh, David was good enough to bring up the points from previously, but they were reflected and they were, everything has been addressed in the uh, planning recommendation report that was questioned today. It is all in the report. Okay, so David, you, you mentioned that the Region Appeal is also looking at the garbage pickup at the, at the driveways, right? Yes, so they are proposing to have curbside pickup um, 
again, they're, at this stage, they're looking at a preliminary level because the rezoning, they'll, they'll be looked at in more detail at the site plan stage. But not, not curbside at the front of, yes. of Hager? Yes. yes, I believe it would be on Hager that they're proposing. Okay. All right. Um, as far as the total area, what, what's the total area we're looking at in terms of, of hectares? What, what is that? Through the chair, the total site area is 1,041 square meters, so about 3,500 square feet. Okay. And there will be six houses on that area? Yes. Um, I'm just throwing this out. Maybe you, maybe you don't know, David, but what's, how does that compare to the development that's going in on uh, Clarence, which is 1.2 hectares and 96 homes? Off the top of my head, I don't know what the exact density figure is for Clarence Street. Those are stacked townhouses, so it very well may be higher given the form of development. But off the top of my head, I don't know the, the density figure. Okay. And um, do, do we know what the net density of the development will be? Uh, through the chair, I will note that the floor space index, which is the amount of developable buildable area to the uh, site area, would be allowed to a maximum of two, but they're only coming in at half of that at about 1.01. So they're, they could have gone a lot more uh, in height and uh, gross floor area had they wanted to do that, uh, as opposed to just coming in with what the proposal currently is. Okay, and that's, that unfortunately is a concern to me. Um, and it's not, a, it's, it's, it's a concern in a, in a good way, so to speak. Um, Alan, can you just go over again what can possibly happen here? What if if this passes and residents decide to appeal, it goes to the OMB. And what could possibly happen at the OMB based on everything we know about the development as it's planned right now? Yeah, so through through you, Mr. Chairman, the it's difficult to really confirm, you know, the different per permutations of what might, may happen, you know, through an, an appeal. But, um, and I, I wouldn't necessarily want to presuppose that, uh, you know, the applicant here or any particular applicant might look to like, change elements of their application uh, if it is that the matter is going to the Ontario Land Trust, you know, you know, different from what uh, the council had regarded, but. I, I can advise that there has been instances that I know of in the past where you know, if there are appeals, uh, changes had occurred that the uh, Ontario Municipal Board, Ontario Land Tribunal, that they have regarded uh, at that time. And uh, it, it, it's a difficult matter. And it, but you know, given that, uh, my, myself, I'm not a lawyer, don't really want to speak to the various permutations in that way, just you know, speaking to what I've, what I've but seen But it is yeah. possible. It is possible if it goes to the OMB that something different can be presented to the OMB than what is presented here. That, that, that's right, Councilor. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, it, that's that's all the questions I have. I don't I don't know if there's anybody else on the board. Um, I don't have anyone else. City Clerk, uh, is there anyone that I'm missing? Through you, Mr. Chair, there's no other members. Um, if there are members of the public that wish to speak, and, and um, unless the committee wishes to reopen the agenda, I did ask if there was anybody else that wished to speak. Um, there is an opportunity at the end of the meeting for what we call public question period, where somebody can come forward and ask questions about decisions made at this meeting. Committee hasn't made a decision on this item yet, so that may be an opportunity for, to ask further questions regarding uh, decision making on this item. Um, Mr. Chair, I do not see any more members on the board to speak to this item. Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I will I will move the report with the understanding that there can still be some room at site plan management, site plan application, to make any further changes that that may be deemed necessary. Yes, I'm so getting shaken heads. Through, through, through you, Mr. Chairman, just want to uh, make 
clarify for you know, committee members and such uh, about the, the process elements as it relates to site plan. So site plan is a uh, delegated matter that, that uh, is with staff, Does, doesn't come in particular to committee or council or governing body in that respect. But really, as it is that staff are working on a site plan application, um, you know, we, we do have regard for you know, all the various technical pieces of information. So you know, if, if there was some information that was with us and we saw that there was uh, really some importance to deviate from what we have as far as the concept and really work towards a change through the site plan, we, we would do that. But uh, it, it is a process, that's process that does not come to a committee or council, nor is it a public process. Okay. And, and is the applicant willing to hear uh, from the public so as we go through this? You, Mr. Chair. So if, we're, if uh, Mr. Corbett is coming forward, uh, committee, we need to add him, and we'll have to reopen the agenda. Mr. Chair? If there, yes. It looks like there may be questions of, of the applicant. So okay. we'll need to reopen the agenda to add the delegate. Okay. Um, is there anyone opposed to adding uh, the delegate? I see none. Back to you, City Clerk. Okay, thank you. Please thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, members of committee and staff. Um, simple answer is yes. Full cooperation with staff. We'll be open to changes to improve it. Always looking for quality control. We want to implement a secondary plan for the area in its truest form and quite willing to cooperate in that regard. Okay, because I think it's pretty important, especially in a neighborhood like this. Agreed. The neighbors, the neighbors need to be heard, mm -hmm. and they also feel that they they have some input. It's going to be their neighborhood. If the six houses get built, they're going to be neighbors to the people who move into these right. six houses. So I think if this happens, the better the development, the better the people that move in there, the better it's going to be for the whole neighborhood. We fully respect that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion uh, moved by Councillor Bowman uh, with the also re uh, moving the staff report and also receiving the delegations. Uh, is there anyone opposed? I see none, so the motion carries. Thank you. We now move on to staff report regarding application to amend the zoning bylaw, Copper uh, Road Ward 3 to permit the outdoor storage of trucks and trailers. Uh, so that was by myself and um, uh, to uh, move that the chair be heard. Thank you. And, and uh, just regarding uh, the report and, and just for uh, the public's uh, understanding, I, I have received uh, some inquiries regarding this, some concerns. Uh, to city staff, can you speak to um, what is being proposed in terms of numbers when we talk about uh, um, storage, what type of, uh, uh, how many, uh, uh, in terms of trucks or, um, you know, what's the capacity of the storage for public record? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll, I'll pass the proverbial mic over to either David Vandenberg or Natika Jagtiani, the, the planner assigned to this file, for some description uh, with respect to the number of storage items and some other elements that I, I think the uh, committee would be interested in hearing in that regard. Thanks. Okay, through the chair, so, so a little bit of history on the site. So on the Committee of Adjustments previously approved a couple of minor variances to allow accessory outdoor storage of vehicle trailers on the site. And what they are proposing through this application is essentially to make that permanent. So essentially what's on the site now is what they're proposing to keep on the site. So the existing building remain, would remain as is. And then along Tompkin Road, and there has been a site plan already to um, review screening and to implement that screening. So that screening would remain. And then the essentially the parking, the, the storage along Tompkin Road that's existing right now is what would be, is being sought for through this, very, through this application. I unfortunately don't have a specific number of vehicles that would be stored there, but is essentially the same area that's being used for storage as exists right now. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, now, in terms of uh, um, in terms of long-term plans, uh, did you have information in terms of uh, uh, understanding that this would be uh, uh, um, temporary? Do you know how? 
Uh, do you know what the future plans would be uh, with this uh, with this area? Yes, the request is for it to be permanent. Um, there are no changes to the existing building or the site that are proposed. So the storage, our understanding is accessory to the existing use on the site. Um, and essentially they're seeking permanent permission to have that out, continue to have that storage. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. I don't see any uh, other speakers. Um, so I guess uh, I'll be happy to move it then, um, uh, move by myself. Is there anyone opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, our next uh, city clerk, we're at no, 7.2. Chair, that concludes all the business, and we are now at councillor question period to be followed by public question period. Okay, members of committee, are there any questions? I see none. Uh, are there any questions from members of the public? Uh, Mr. Chair, there is one that has come in. It is from Melissa Bergaman. Uh, this is in regards to uh, statutory public notice item 5.6, um, the development proposal by Solmar. And I'll read the question. It looks like it's in two parts. The first is, what measures are being taken to protect local wildlife, specifically birds? In Canada, about 25 million birds die each year from collisions with glass. Most species of birds in Canada are protected and even causing unintentional injury is an environmental offense. During the day, some of the issues are transparency of glass and reflecting the sky or habitat. At night, the light from buildings can confuse birds who use the moon or stars for navigation. Some birds even get trapped in artificial light areas, flying until they collapse from exhaustion. This information is found on the FLAP Canada, um, which is flap.org, um, along with other more relevant information. So what steps are the developers and policymakers taking to protect our local bird population? That's the first question. I'll read the second question. Um, how is it possible that in our supposed democ democratic society that, that, that an application can completely bypass the residents and elected officials, voted to represent the residents and go straight to a minister for approval? This is an affront to the residents of Brampton and the values that we and all residents of Canada take pride in. It comes off as something that is being deliberately kept away from the public and almost done in secret, which is extremely suspicious. Or is it that developers know that the local residents' concerns are valid and want to ignore these concerns to ensure that their outrageous plan is approved and they can receive maximum profits? I think that an explanation why the normal process was ignored is owed to the residents of Brampton. And these are questions from Melissa Bergaman, a resident of Church Street. So through you, Mr. Chairman, perhaps I can provide some response? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So firstly, with respect to the, the reference to health and safety of, of birds and really impacts that could be on them from, uh, from proposed development, as I understand it right now, the, the current documents that are received from the applicants don't uh, reference anything in particular uh, on safety matters as it relates to, to birds. And I, I don't believe that staff had asked for that at this point in time either. Um, given though the, the reference here tonight uh, a couple times with respect to the really potential impacts to birds, this is something that I think I and, and staff will, will look into. Uh, just to understand whether there, there could be some uh, elements of treatment that we could look to, uh, and, and perhaps, perhaps if not through the rezoning application, but really through a, a, a later site plan application, there, there might be some urban design treatment that can be utilized into the facades of the building to, to help in that regard. So uh, staff will, will look at that. Uh, with respect to the, the MZO matter, I can just comment to uh, uh, really advise members of the public that the, the MZO is a, is a tool uh, identified within the, the legislation, so in particular the, the Planning Act, that does give uh, powers to the Minister of Municipal Affairs uh, for his consideration or uh, you know, per, perhaps her consideration um, with respect to development applications. And really it's uh, seen as really a, an important tool where it is that there is uh, you know, key development matters that have to be regarded in, in a higher manner. And so it really that uh, MZO request that what was put forward previously as it relates to, to the reference development by, by Solmar on, on Main Street 
was was supported by by council previously, and it was noted within that uh, direction or that decision from council the, the rationale for for the decision, uh, referencing uh, affordable housing, uh, importance of uh, really satisfying key provincial legislation, a number of other you know, key matters included in that decision as well. Uh, and really, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, uh, Mr. Chairman, with respect to uh, what, what's transpired there and the, the, the tool that is available through the Planning Act. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any, uh, as there's no other questions for members of the public, I wanna thank uh, staff and uh, city clerk, um, I believe that is it in terms of uh, questions. That is it, Mr. Chair. We can move on to adjournment. Sounds good. Thank you very much. So I do have a motion uh, moved by Councillor Willens uh, to a move uh, adjournment to our next uh, scheduled meeting of June 6. Is there anyone opposed? I see none. So the motion carries. Thank you very much, uh, staff and everyone delegated tonight and everyone stay safe. Thank you.